2025 marks the 10th anniversary of one of my all-time favorite shows, Scream Queens, and in a lot of ways, the show feels incredibly ahead of its time. So it is with a great amount of love and appreciation that I want to embark on a deep dive of season one, and this deep dive will consist of episode recaps interspersed with all sorts of trivia, bonus content, and surely some tangents as well. Now you may remember a video I did about a year ago where I explored the production history of Scream Queens, as well as did a deep dive into the pilot episode. So since I've already dove deep into episode one of Scream Queens in that video, I'll be starting this deep dive instead with a more abridged recap of the pilot episode. But if you are in need of more Scream Queens content after this video or before this video, there's a lot of fun stuff in that video as well. But without further ado, let's just cut to the chase and here is everything you need to know about episode one of Scream Queens. First things first, in 1995, a party was held at the Kappa Kappa Tau sorority house near the fictional Wallace University. It was at this party that a young woman by the name of Sophia Doyle gave birth in an upstairs bathtub before she ended up passing away. Also, side note, I'm going to be approaching this deep dive as if you've all seen the first season, and so I'm gonna be pretty transparent about who all of the killers are and all of the twists and turns and things like that. So if you've never seen Scream Queens before, I suggest seeking it out and experiencing it for yourself and then coming back. So on that note, the pilot depicts this scene with Sophia giving birth to only one baby, but full disclosure, it is later revealed that Sophia actually gave birth to twins. But that is one of the many details that was covered up in a cover-up. Flash forward 20 years and Kappa Kappa Tau is still around. This time it's being run by Chanel Oberlin, and her minions, but I'll go ahead and let them introduce themselves to you. Chanel number two. Chanel number three. Chanel number five. There was a Chanel number four, but she got meningitis. She was like, I'm sick. I have to go home. And I was like, no, stay. But she went home anyway, and then she died. Later, we are introduced to the dean of students at Wallace University, Kathy Munch, who has a hunch that Chanel may have been involved with an incident that resulted in the previous Kappa president, Melanie Dorcas, getting severe burns all over her body. An incoming freshman at Wallace University, Grace Gardner, is roommates with Zayde Williams, also a freshman, who one day dreams of becoming president of the United States. Grace tells Zayde that she wants to pledge Kappa Kappa Tau, since her mother was once a Kappa. You see, Grace's mother died in a fire when she was young. At least that's what her dad, Wes, tells her. Zayde agrees to pledge Kappa Kappa Tau with Grace, and later, Kathy and president of the national chapter of, of Kappa Kappa Tau, Gigi Caldwell, announced that this year, the sorority will be required to accept all of their pledges. These pledges include Grace, Zayde, and some others that Chanel has her own offensive nicknames for, so I'll go ahead and let her introduce them to you. Neck Grace. Real name, Hester Ulrich. Deaf, Taylor Swift. Real name, Tiffany something. Predatory Les. Real name, Mac or Butch or something. One last pledge is Jennifer, who is obsessed with candles and operates a YouTube channel reviewing them. Representation. Later, we meet Chad Radwell and Boone Clemens, members of the Dickie Dollar Scholars fraternity, and essentially they are the frat boy equivalents to Chanel and her Chanel's. Chanel and Chad are dating, at least at the moment. At the local coffee shop, The Grind, Grace meets Pete, who has a complex history with Chanel. Much later in the episode, in a prank gone wrong, Chanel kills the housekeeper, Mrs. Bean, by dunking her head in a fryer that had been turned on unbeknownst to her. Chanel bribes her pledges to keep Mrs. Bean's death a secret, and they all help hide her body in a freezer. However, when Chanel and Chad return to the freezer later, Mrs. Bean's body is nowhere to be found. Meanwhile, the Chanel's attempt a blood oath, but Chanel Chanel number two gets cold feet and she heads upstairs for her big scene. In said big scene, Chanel number two and the Red Devil engage in one of the campiest death scenes of the series where they only communicate via text message and number two manages to send one final tweet before taking her last breath. Rest in peace, Chanel number two.
Once the other Chanel's discover number two's body, they come to the conclusion that Mrs. Bean has risen from the dead to enact her revenge on the girls. And in the pilot episode's final scene, the pledges are buried up to their necks in a reference to Heather's, and Tiffany DeSalle, aka Deaf Taylor Swift, unfortunately bites the dust. Or should I say, bites the lawnmower. Rest in peace, Tiffany. This pilot episode will always be legendary, from all of its references to films like Heather's or Halloween, to its instantly iconic scenes like the introduction of the Chanel's, the introduction of Kathy Munch, and of course Chanel Number no. 2's death scene, just to name a few. One of the main goals of Scream Queen's comedy is to poke fun at the incredibly racist, homophobic, and toxic cultures that have historically surrounded the Greek system at several universities. And thus the writing on this show definitely pushes the limits of what you can even say on network television. And this attempt to really go for the jugular when it comes to deriving comedy from its racist characters, I think sometimes it works and sometimes the jokes are more uncomfortable than they are funny. And particularly in these first few episodes, of season one, the writers are really dancing around the lines, and every once in a while I do think they go over that line, but as the season goes on, the show really finds itself and relaxes into some more lighthearted humor while still putting the spotlight on some serious issues within the Greek system. Now before we move on to episode two, let's take a second to talk about the Red Devil himself and discuss all that went into his design and creation. In this bonus video, Red Devil designer David Anderson details how he and a team of illustrators created various iterations of the now iconic masks, markings, and colors. I guess the opportunity came about as a result of me working on Freak Show last season. I'm not really designing anything. What I'm doing is just kind of very accurately and precisely interpreting what I'm seeing on the page. And I hired a team of illustrators. I didn't hire one, I hired five. So 15 illustrations out on the table for the first show and tell, and Ryan goes walking down and goes like that. That artist is a new kid to town, and his name is Xander Smith. He won the Bake Off. It was actually this design. He has upper eye shadow, no black lips, and black horns, black goatee, and the red is wicked red. And so here we are right now, we're about to start shooting this thing and we've been working on this character development for probably about two months now. Now that we're two weeks out and it's now in my hands to make it real and I have about a week to do it. Episode 2, entitled Hell Week, aired as the second half of the show's two-hour premiere, and it begins with Dean Kathy Munch dodging reporters before she questions the Kappa sisters about Mrs. Bean's and Number 2's whereabouts, and it is in this meeting that Chanel agrees to allow the pledges to move in to Kappa House for their safety, and additionally, the house will be getting its own security guard. Sam says that she doesn't feel comfortable having a male security guard, which clears the way for a certain Secure Enforcement Solutions officer to make her debut later in the episode. Everybody say thank you, Sam! In the next scene, Hester walks in on the Chanel's brainstorming ways to dispose of Number 2's body, but Number 3 assures Hester that Number 2 is just sleeping. She's asleep. Chanel Number 2 is asleep. Between her delivery of these two lines, Billy Lord really starts to show her innate ability to steal an entire scene with her trademark understated line deliveries. This dynamic contrasts perfectly with Abigail Breslin's Number 5, who is similar to Number 3 in her naivety, but where Number 3 is more dark and mysterious, Number 5, on the other hand, is very outgoing and clearly has a more optimistic outlook on life even if her optimism is constantly being squashed by people she seeks approval from, namely Chanel Oberlin or her parents, but we'll talk about them much, much later. Of course, number three and number five's dynamics work incredibly well with Chanel as their anchor of negativity. Chanel brings out number three's dark side and reigns in number five's hopeless optimism. The writing of these three characters and especially the performance of these three characters by Emma Roberts, Billy Lord, and Abigail Breslin that's really the core of Scream Queens. It's a major reason why season one is so successful, and it's one of the only reasons why season two can slightly hold a candle. While we're talking about number three and number five, let's hear what Billy and Abigail had to say about them in their character series videos, which were just a little piece of marketing material that were sporadically uploaded to the Scream Queens YouTube channel during the airing of season one. Chanel number three is a sassy but 
low-key individual. <laughs> She is main Chanel, Chanel Oberlin's minion. But she's like not really sure how she feels about it. She loves Chanel, but you know, there may be some growth. So we'll see what happens with Chanel number three. I'm on episode two and I'm still sassy, so. Abigail, take one, come to sleep. I play Chanel number five. Chanel number five is kind of the more conservative, a little bit uptight, kind of a mean girl. She's a little bit crazy. She's really like, smart and cunning and sociopathic. A little bit insane, and it's exactly what I'd hoped it would be. And um, she has some really things that she says in a couple of the episodes where I'm like, is it okay for me to say this? Is this allowed on television? It's, it's box, it's totally, they're, they're chill, they're chill. It's been so exciting, and I, I can't believe that I'm in this show. Like, it's such a dream job for me. <laughs> Back to the episode, Hester doesn't buy number three's assurance that number two is just sleeping, and she promises to keep number two's death a secret. Hester also has some very conspicuous advice on how to dispose of her body. Chanel rejects these ideas in favor of putting number two in the same freezer that Mrs. Bean recently disappeared from. Great plan. In the next scene, Gigi introduces the Chanel's to their new security guard, Denise Hemphill of Secure Enforcement Solutions. Finally. Wait, so you don't have a a gun? No, I do not, but I do have a nightstick, okay? I have pepper spray, and I have a walkie-talkie. Later, Grace and Pete decide that they must break into that secret Kappa basement room, and they then kiss, but after Grace leaves, Pete starts acting exceptionally creepy. Later, Wes tells Kathy that he wants to pull Grace from her classes due to the recent events. Ultimately, Kathy convinces Wes to keep Grace enrolled, but she also agrees to letting Wes be hired as one of Grace's professors so that he can keep keep a closer eye on her. Grace successfully breaks into the secret room in Kappa's basement. Grace finds the very bathtub that Sophia Doyle gave birth and died in way back in 1995, but before Grace can discover any more secrets, she is caught by Chanel, who tells Grace the tale of Sophia Doyle, this time divulging some new information about how Kathy Munch covered it all up. In a later scene, Chanel breaks up with Chad, but Chanel has second thoughts shortly after as she visits Chad at the Dickie Dollar Scholar House in the next scene to get back together with him, but she ends up finding Chad in bed with Boone. Chanel gets upset, Chad accuses her of homophobia, and then he breaks up with her, because that makes sense. Next, Pete clumsily breaks into Dean Munch's office, and he finds these five names in a file marked Kappa House Party 95. The names are Greenwell, Doyle, Meyer, Cohen, and Stevens. Later, Grace and Pete unpack these events, but Grace gets spooked by a red devil costume in Pete's closet. Pete explains that he is sometimes the school mascot, but Grace is already coming up with a theory and realizes that Pete is about the same age that Sophia Doyle's baby would be, and she hightails out of his dorm, presumably with a new suspect. Once Grace leaves, Pete gives the camera another weird-ass look that doesn't really make any sense in the context of what we know about him, but I digress. Later, Gigi spots West spying on Grace outside of the Kappa house, and she tries to assure him of Grace's safety. She notices that all of the songs that Wes is playing in his car are male power ballads from 1995, which is another big clue that not only is Gigi connected to the events of 1995, but Wes may also be more involved than he is letting on as well, as they both have emotional attachments to the year 95. In the next scene, Chanel is at her very worst as she hazes the pledges some more while being incredibly racist to Zayde. Uh, here's where I think even I begin to take some offense with the writing on this show. Now, I'm all for satire, and I think nine times out of ten this show is successfully poking fun at a lot of terrible human behaviors, including things like homophobia and racism, but I think context and point of view are very necessary, and I don't think it's the place of these three white men who created and wrote most of the show, nor Emma Roberts, to try and satirize racism, especially when it culminates in Chanel just saying and doing the most racist things that she can get away with on network TV. Where's the irony? Where's the perspective? Not only that, but this coming from a Ryan Murphy production, including Emma Roberts and Leah Michelle, both of whom have had their own horror stories about unfair treatment or bad behavior on sets. But more on that later. 
Denise then leaves her coworker, Chantal, from Secure Enforcement Solutions, alone in the van to investigate a scream coming from the Kappa house, where, sure enough, Chanel has just had an anticlimactic confrontation with the Red Devil. The Chanels and the Pledges decide to go upstairs and hunt the Red Devil down, ignoring Denise's pleas for them to do the exact opposite. The girls don't end up finding the Red Devil, but they do find an ominous message written in blood. As the girls scream, the camera goes canted, and the lighting becomes highly saturated reds and greens. I recognize this as being a nod towards the giallo genre, specifically Suspiria by Derek. Argento. As Denise runs back to the van, the Red Devil appears in the back seat for the first time in the series, but not the last time. But by the time Denise gets back to the van, Shondell already has a knife in her throat. Ah! Shondell, why you got a knife in your throat? Denise drives a few feet, stops, then pushes Shondell's corpse out of the van before continuing to drive away in terror. Rest in peace, Shondell. We later learn in the penultimate episode of this season that something major happened in this scene that we, the audience, didn't get to see at the time. So it turns out that Pete witnessed Shondell's murder, and he then followed the Red Devil all the way back to the Dicky Dollar Scholar house, where he watched as Boone unmasked himself as one of the Red Devil. Levels. And essentially, he blackmails Pete into becoming a fourth Red Devil. But to be fair, Pete seemed pretty into it, blackmail aside. After this, I guess Pete left and Boone decided to go work out, because back in episode 2, we then get a Boone exercise montage as the steady cam lurks around the house a la Black Christmas or a la Halloween. Soon enough, Boone comes face to face with a Red Devil. We then finally get introduced to some more Dicky Dollar Scholars, Earl Grey, Caulfield, Roger, and Dodger, to name a few, who find Boone's seemingly dead body laid out on a table with about 200 lit candles. Hmm, maybe candle vlogger's the killer. Then, at the mortuary, we get another killer steady cam shot as the Red Devil breaks in, reveals that Boone is actually still alive, and he is, in fact, one of the Red Devil killers, as I spoiled for you moments ago. And that is the end of episode 2. So what did I think of episode 2? Well, I I think it is a slightly less successful second half to the events of the pilot episode. Again, I do think the hazing scenes go a little bit too far in this episode, and similarly, I feel like the writing is a little bit sloppier in episode two as well. But the saving grace of this episode is Denise Hemphill, because Niecy Nash is such a natural comedian that she elevates each and every line with so much humor and character. And as Ryan Murphy has said in interviews, a lot of Niecy Nash's stuff on Scream Queens was improvised. And speaking of Nisi Nash bets, let us all take a moment to indulge in the lost art that is the blooper reel with future special agent Denise Hemphill. Hold on, listen up. Something happened and I forgot what it is. What is it? Denise Hemphill is gonna solve this crime. Solve it. Solve this crime. Hallelujah! Anybody want some burger shack? <laughs> In another bit of Scream Queens bonus content, Glenn Powell gave the Scream Queens YouTube channel a 360 degree tour of the soundstage where they shot the interior scenes for the Kappa House. See, what's really important is to chop your arms when you're doing virtual reality. See, like that? You like that? Okay, we're gonna start here in the atrium. This is not a room that they're trying to fool you. You can walk through this entire house it's all real, and it's all on the stage, which is crazy. So we're walking through the kitchen here. That right there is they, where they burned Miss Bean's face off. A lot of action goes on here. Don't step under the ladder. That's bad luck. And on this show, that means you're going to get killed next episode. All right. We're walking. We're walking this way. All right, all right, all right. Thank you for joining me on a little brief tour of the Kappa House. How cool is this, huh? How cool is this? Watch how fast I am. Sometimes, sometimes I do this to just get warmed up in the morning. Next up is episode three entitled Chainsaw. 
Episode 3 opens with Grace and Zayday discussing their shared suspicions that Pete may be the killer. Then, speak of the devil, the Red Devil himself begins to charge towards Grace. Luckily, Grace tases him just in time with a taser supplied by Zayday's grandmother, and with Zayday's help, the girls are able to take down the Red Devil. One problem though, once the Red Devil is unmasked, Zayday recognizes him as Eugene from her poli sci class, and he's no Red Devil. But but if that's the case, why was he aggressively charging towards Grace? I guess we'll never know. In the following scene, Chanel and Chanel number no. 5 discover that Chanel number no. 2's body has gone missing. And number no. 5 says, I'm sort of over this whole serial murder thing that's going on right now. And she will instead be pursuing her budding relationship with the twin brothers of the Dickie Dollar Scholars, Roger and Dodger. Zayday and Grace snoop around number no. 2's room and they discover a mysterious stain in the carpet. Just just then, Denise emerges from thin air and determines that the stain is indeed blood. Denise then pulls up number two's tweets and comes to the conclusion that she must have been murdered. Look at this. I'm being murdered by the Red Devil. Grace says that this can't be the case though, as number two is still posting on Instagram. There she is by the pool sunbathing. They're just not even cute. With their suspicions now heightened, Grace and Zayday decide to drop everything and go visit number two's parents in Bel Air. And Denise too abandons her station at the Kappa House to tag along with them. At a vigil for the recent deaths, Chanel and Chad get back together before they break up once again. Jesus Christ, you guys. Then Sam approaches a very reluctant number three and asks about one of her tattoos. Don't ask a lot of questions about me, okay? <laughs> At this vigil, Dean Munch downplays the recent on-campus deaths and casts doubts on the rumors of a serial killer. She does recognize, though, that Wallace University needs a new mascot. Enter Coney the Ice Cream Cone. <laughs> In Bel Air at the number two family mansion, we meet Chanel number two's parents, played by Charisma Carpenter from Buffy and Roger Bart from Desperate Housewives. Number two's parents reveal to Grace, Zayde, and Denise that number two and Chad Radwell were sleeping together. Then, Number Two's parents come to the conclusion that their daughter must be drinking again, and they tell our makeshift detectives that if they find Chanel Number Two, tell her to never come home again. Speaking of Chanel Number Two, may she rest in peace, let's take a look at what Ariana Grande had to say about her character in this season in her character series video. Chanel Number Two, I think, is a good friend. I think she's a loyal friend to Chanel. She, I feel like, is the most timid of the group. I think she might be like like the safest, least daring one of the group. Chanel number two's main goal in life? I don't know. I, I don't know if she has goals. Just being a Chanel, I think she's just so happy being a part. And I feel like she's a good friend, you know? In class with Sam and Jennifer the Candle Vlogger, Grace discovers that her dad has scammed his way into becoming her film studies professor. Grace dramatically exits the classroom in anger, and I bet you're wondering, what film does Wes choose to screen on day one of his intro to film analysis class? Well, it's none other than the Texas Chainsaw Massacre, a film he calls the greatest of all time. He may not be too far off from that claim, however, this is an an absolute insane pick for day one of a film studies class. After this classroom is subjected to those horrors, Wes has some stupid things to say about this film and a couple mildly interesting things to say when you take into account both Wes Gardner's and his daughter Grace Gardner's character arcs across not only this season but also in season two. Sally survives in the end, but does she? After class, Wes and Gigi discuss how trauma can affect people, and not to give Ian Brennan, who wrote this episode, too much credit, but this exchange is pretty interesting in the grander context of both seasons, since these are two killers discussing how, essentially, experiencing trauma can sometimes result in the perpetuation of that very trauma, and that certainly is the case for both of these characters. We've all been traumatized. And what we do with the hurt from that trauma defines who we are. Do we look inward and, and heal, or do we take that hurt and turn it into anger? 
While I don't actually believe that Wes's killer turn in season two was planned out this far in advance, I do think this scene works in both the context it was intended to work in and also with season two in mind. The reason why this works so well is because both Nassim and Oliver Hudson are playing the scene as if they could be the killer, which is a technique that the cast has discussed in interviews a lot, as none of them actually knew who the killers were until very late in the season, so the directors got them to do various takes, some where they played the scene as if they were the killer, and some as if they were not the killer, and they are both playing this scene like they could be the killer, hence why it works so well in both contexts. But anyway, next we've got some more Michael Myers POV shot homages as we follow a day in the life of the new mascot, Coney the Ice Cream Cone. Unfortunately for Coney though, this is the last day in his life as he is swiftly murdered by the Red Devil. Rest in peace, Coney. Interestingly, the Red Devil uses a chainsaw for the first time in this scene, which of course takes place directly after Wes's screening of the Texas Chainsaw Massacre, which meant for viewers at the time, we could theoretically narrow down a killer suspect list to everyone who was present in Wes's class, and knowing the killers in hindsight, Gigi fits the bill. In the next scene, Hester snoops around Chanel's closet while Pink Martini's cover of Whatever Will Be Will Be plays, which is another homage to Heathers, as that song also plays during the opening of that film. Chanel catches Hester moseying through her belongings, and instead of scolding her, Chanel gets the idea to give Hester a makeover in an effort to get Chad Radwell back. Hope that doesn't backfire. Speaking of Chanel Oberlin, let's take a moment to reflect on what Emma Roberts had to say about the meanest girl of them all in her character series video. She isn't exactly the nicest person, definitely not warm and fuzzy. She's a bitch, for lack of a better word. But it's really fun to get to play her because there's so much comedy, and I think um, what Ryan Murphy does best is this kind of sarcastic, uh, dark humor. And so Chanel has a lot of that going on, which is really fun for me. Madison on Coven was one of my favorite characters, and there's kind of a lot of that humor with Chanel. Kathy and Gigi play a tennis match together and propose that they move into Kappa House for a week. Kathy also proposes that Gigi stay the heck away from Wes. She calls dibs. Gigi! You're terrible at tennis. I'm gonna leave. Stay away from my man. I call dibs. Can't call dibs on a person. Later, number three goes up to Sam's room and asks to be soulmates. Soulmates. <laughs> Now that they're soulmates, number three feels comfortable enough to tell Sam some secrets. Number one, that she's from Frozen Dinner Money. And number two, her dad is actually none other than Charles Manson. My dad is not my real dad. See, my mom is crazy and always thinks aliens are talking to her. And the year before I was born, she started corresponding with this really bad man. I took a DNA test and I found out this guy's my real father. Who's the guy? Charles Manson. Yeah, you heard that right, but essentially number three is kind of manipulating Sam into being her alibi because she fears her familial connection to Charles Manson will implicate her as a suspect if anybody were to find that out. This Manson connection is wild and came out of nowhere, but it does get brought up a few times throughout the season, so keep it in mind. Next, the pledges and the Chanel's reveal that Chanel number two, Chanel number three, and Chanel number five all had affairs with Chad Radwell. And and just then, Chanel descends down the staircase to debut a newly made over Hester, or should we say Chanel number six. I'd like you to meet Chanel number six. <laughs> Number five protests this strongly, and she incites a revolution against Chanel's presidency amongst the pledges. But before we move on from Chanel number six, aka Hester, let's hear what Leah Michelle had to say about the character in her character series video. Hester is very interesting. There's a lot for me to sort of play with here. I think that her neck brace is definitely the star of the show. She's very different from all of the other girls, the Chanel's and she really wants to join the sorority. I talked to Ryan about this a couple of months ago. He told me, you know, that he was doing this new horror comedy. He wanted me to be a part of it, and I think it was really just because he was afraid of the meltdown of 
post glee for me. Um, but I, I really feel like this is a, such an amazing project. Meanwhile, the Dickie Dollar Scholars hold a meeting where Chad theorizes that Boone's death was not a suicide. So Chad, Caulfield, Earl, Roger, and Dodger decide to do something about it. He thinks Boone was killed by the Red Devil. So Chad, Caulfield, Earl, Roger, and Dodger hit the streets to incite a fight with the Red Devil and avenge Boone. Meanwhile, Grace visits Pete as she begins to build her case that the recent murders must have something to do with the baby that was born in the Kappa bathtub circa 1995. Grace tells Pete that her working theory is that Chad Radwell is the baby in the bathtub. Pete then shares his findings regarding the five names he saw in Dean Munch's office. Then Grace and Pete venture to track down one of the 1995 Kappa sisters by the name of Mandy Greenwell. Later that night, to the tune of Everybody, Backstreet's Back by the Backstreet Boys, the Dickie Dollar Scholars hunt down the Red Devil, dressed in all white and armed with only baseball bats. The Scholars proceed to beat up any and everything that is the color red, the logic there being that the Red Devil must own every red thing on this street, and damaging his property will summon him. Somehow this works as the Red Devil appears suddenly. The Scholars charge at him, but surprise, there are two Red Devils, and they've got our Scholars cornered. The guys soon learn that baseball bats are no match against chainsaws, and Chad is nearly killed by one of the Red Devils, before Caulfield comes to the rescue. In the defense of Chad, Caulfield ends up losing both of his arms. Elsewhere that night, Denise tricks Sade into some handcuffs, accusing her of being the Red Devil based on two pieces of evidence. Six months ago, you tweeted at Shonda Rhimes, if Annalise Keating really wanted to get away with murder, she find a partner and work as a team. Hashtag Kahoot. Zayday Williams, have a chainsaw under your bed. Oh, what? Zayday explains that the chainsaw is simply another weapon that her grandmother has sent her to defend herself against the killer, so Denise lets her go, but she warns her. I got my eye on you. You crazy as hell. I got my eye on you. Later, Gigi is quote-unquote attacked by the Red Devil at the Kappa house. In hindsight, this must have been a choreographed plan between Gigi and whichever one of the other two Red Devils is under this particular mask. Wes barges in to protect Gigi, and the Red Devil attacks him. This clearly pisses Gigi off, and she promptly kicks the Red Devil's ass. <laughs> The Red Devil gets away, then Kathy comes running downstairs almost immediately after, and there is definitely not enough time in between those two events for anyone to logically accuse Kathy of being the Red Devil, but oddly enough, that is exactly what Wes does. You're the killer. And the episode ends with that completely baseless accusation. This episode's got a lot of memorable moments like Grace, Zede, and Denise's trip to Bel Air, or the Dickie Dollar Scholars face off against the Red Devils, but a bulk of this episode did feel like majorly set up to things that will get paid off later in the season, which is definitely not a bad thing and par for the course for early episodes of any season of television. But I will say that the next few episodes do a better job at upping the stakes and upping the comedy, all while still taking the time to set up and develop those killer-related reveals. The next episode is called Haunted House, and it is the first of three Halloween specials from season one of Scream Queens. Yes, you heard me correctly, Scream Queen season one has three Halloween specials, because of course it did. I think Brad or Ryan or Ian may have been a little obsessed with Taylor Swift at the time of this show's writing, because not only is there the character of Tiffany, aka Deaf Taylor Swift, rest in peace, but also this episode opens with chanel Ween, a holiday made up by chanel Oberlin, where she sends morbid gifts to her adoring online fans around the Halloween season. This was, at the time, a very timely reference to Taylor Swift's own made-up holiday, Swiftmas, which also came with an insane YouTube video documenting her fans' very emotional responses to the gifts that she had sent them. Honestly, let me just play the two pieces of media next to each other to show you all of the ways that this episode's cold open directly lifted from the Taylor Swift video it is parody. This 
this severed hand is for Mallory. <gasps> These razor apples for Daisy. This package is for Mallory. This is actually a Hanukkah present. <laughs> I love reading your posts, especially seeing your escapades with Eva. You're a bright light in my life, and I wanted you to know how much you impressed me with your frumpy spirit. You are so devastatingly mediocre and adorable! And I wanted to tell you how much you impressed me with your giving spirit. Susan, who's always posting sad videos of herself online, and she lives someplace horrible. So, I guess we're just gonna have to drive to Susan's house and deliver some Chanelloween presents in person. This is wonderful girl named Steph, who I've met before, but she has a tiny young son named Layton, who she posts videos of all the time, and I've never gotten to meet him before. Um, so, I guess we're just gonna go and drive to Connecticut and bring Layton some Christmas presents. In the next scene, Detective Chisholm interviews and clears Kathy of any culpability in Gigi's and Wes's chainsaw attack from the last episode, because duh. Do you mean to suggest I changed out of my nightgown, strapped myself into a skin-tight pleather red devil costume, climbed out a second-story dormer, and shimmied to the ground with a chainsaw? Before entering a window I had left open, tried to kill you, then left out the window, climbed back up the wall, changed back into my nightgown, and raced downstairs all in the course of about 90 seconds. Yes, that is exactly what we mean to suggest. The Denise also arrives at the scene and has some things to say about Zayde and in tribute to the late Sean Dell. This, this, this golf frat douchebag got his arms chopped off. Yo, killer is that Zayde girl. Sean Dell, if you can hear me in that Best Buy parking lot in the sky, I am so sorry that I pushed you out of my car and drove off real scared. Speaking of Denise, let's take a look at what Nisi Nash Betts had to say about everyone's favorite secure enforcement solutions security guard in her character series video. Will she be able to keep the girls safe? I don't know about that, but she's going to give it her best effort. I'm planning on drawing inspiration for Denise Hemphill from dun, 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 my mother. And one of the things that's so delicious about Denise, oftentimes the black people I know are always saying, I wouldn't have did that. I would have said this. I would have said that. And Denise does everything right. She's not going in the house. She's not staying in the house. You better run away. Let me give you some sound advice. She really is the voice of reason. In the next scene, Grace and Pete arrive at Mandy Greenwell's house, one of the girls from the night in 1995, and Pete wastes everyone's time by doing his terrible Matthew McConaughey impersonation, which honestly does track with this character's motivations. As we know, he's already working with the Red Devils at this point in the season. Grace and Pete are dressed as Matthew McConaughey and Kate Hudson from their film How to Lose a Guy in 10 Days, which could be a coincidental double Easter egg since Kate Hudson is actually the sister of Oliver Hudson, aka Wes Gardner. Mandy Greenwell invites them in and talks about how her life was forever changed the night that Sophia died. We then get another flashback to that very night in 1995, where Kathy Munch, who at the time was the administrative liaison to Greek life at Wallace University, essentially blackmails the young sorority sisters, Mandy, Coco, Bethany, and Amy, into aiding in the cover-up of Sophia's death. Mrs. Agatha Bean chimes in with a truly deranged idea on how to hide the body that makes makes me wonder if Agatha truly had more in common with her sister than we may have thought. We need to dispose of this body on our own. Now I've got everything we need in the kitchen to make sausages out of her. I can sell them at the farmer's market on Sunday, or I can just feed them these bitches for dinner. <sighs> Back in the present day, Mandy tells Pete and Grace about the fates of her sorority sisters, but the math's not really mathing. They are definitely leaving some people out. Other girls changed their names, moved away. One girl killed herself, I heard. Another girl was institutionalized. Third is actually doing pretty well on Fox News.
Much to Grace's dismay, Mandy doesn't know what happened to the baby, but she does know that the baby was a girl, which squashes most of Grace's current theories. But again, Mandy fails to mention the fact that there was more than one baby, but this does actually get explained later on in the season, so stay tuned. Next, Earl Grey and Zayde meet for coffee at the grind, where he gives her his support for running for Kappa president, as he believes that he and Zayde could represent a potential shift in the culture of Greece. Greek life, specifically a shift away from the racism that is heavily associated with the history of many fraternities and sororities. But Earl says that Chad is unbeatable as president of the Dickie Dollar Scholars, so instead he'll just stick to giving Zayde campaign advice. Oh blimey no, I already tried and lost, trust me, Chad is unbeatable. Speaking of Zayde, let's hear what Kiki Palmer had to say about the character in her character series video. Zayde is perfect in every way. I'm kidding now. Zayde is your normal teen girl, but she's very driven, you know what I mean? She came on a scholarship to this school, and she's very focused, but she also knows how to have good, clean fun. Zayde's best friend, or I should say ally in the show, is Grace, and she's played by Skylar Samuels. Zayde is easygoing and kind of up for anything. I think she's confident in who she is, so the idea of joining a sorority isn't totally crazy. So I think she's just interested because it's something her girlfriend's interested in. Next, the ladies of Kappa Kappa Tau carve jack-o'-lanterns, and number three seems to be completely abandoning her strategy of keeping her father's identity on the down low. Mine's Charles Manson. Love. Zayde uses this activity as an opportunity to announce her intentions to run for Kappa president, and she also announces a haunted house she plans on throwing to raise money for sickle cell anemia, which was a suggestion made by Earl Grey. In classic Chanel fashion, she does not take this well. Later, Chanel sharpens her knives in her closet at 3 a.m. when number three and number five come to console her, but this soon becomes hazardous as much like myself, Chanel likes to talk with her hands. But once Chanel puts down the knives, the Chanel's brainstorm their own event to challenge Zayde's haunted house, and they decide on a haunted pumpkin patch. And to compete with Zayde's cause of sickle cell anemia, the Chanel's pumpkin patch will be a fundraiser to raise money for a cause near and dear to their heart. Black, hairy, tongue. Also during this brainstorming session, number three drops a bit of accidental season two foreshadowing. A haunted pumpkin patch created expressly to raise money for some disease more heinous than Zayde's sickle cell anemia haunted house. Like Wolfman syndrome. No! That same night, Mandy enjoys a viewing of the 1993 classic Leprechaun when she gets a visit from the Red Devil in a murder scene that feels straight out of AHS Freak Show. Rarely does Scream Queens deliver a scene that actually makes me tense, but the way Mandy truly has no escape from her fate in this trailer and she's completely at the Red Devil's mercy is truly chilling and makes me feel very claustrophobic. Rest in peace, Mandy. Then, after a screening of Children of the Corn in Wes's film class, Wes gives another pointed lecture about one not being able to escape their past. Like seriously dude, let's find something else to talk about. The regrets, the mistakes of our youth will destroy us in our adulthood. That we can't escape our inner child, one we would rather forget, but who at the end of the day has all the power. Wes, you hijacked your daughter's film class when what you really needed to do was go to therapy. After class, Grace emotionally confronts Wes about her mother, and Wes delivers a line that is both delivered hilariously and also sheds more light on what a shitty dad Wes truly is. Why am I the only person in Kappa without a mother? Shh. You gotta give me more here, okay? I don't understand what you're getting at. Are you on bath salt? <laughs> Grace asks Wes point blank if she was the baby in the bathtub and if Sophia was her mother. Wes denies this theory and Grace leaves in a fury. Then Grace meets Pete at 52 Shady Lane where he says there is a lead to who the baby in the bathtub is. But before he can spit it out, they run into Zayde and Earl Grey, who happen to be scoping out this decrepit abandoned house for their own haunted house fundraiser. But the four of them are not alone as Denise Hemphill too is on on the scene. Denise and Pete then begin to tell the history of this house, which results in one of my favorite jokes of the series. This house is haunted. She's right. See, See I, I did, did some, some research, research down, down at the, the library. library. When? when? Last, Last night. night. I, I didn't, didn't see you there. there. Which, which library? library? Baker Street. Oh, okay. 
Denise and Pete then detail the fable of the hag of Shady Lane, a woman who once inhabited this abandoned house and was known for wailing loudly into the night and stealing dolls from around the neighborhood. Denise then casts more suspicion towards Zayde, but luckily Zayde has a solid alibi by the name of Burger Shack. You chopped the arms off that dumbass golf guy. Oh, didn't know I knew that, did you? Yeah. You were supposed to be at your philosophy study group that night. Because I skipped it to go to the Burger Shack with Jennifer, the candle blogger. Ooh, Burger Shack. This time, though, Zayde's got some accusations for Denise as well, since she's done her own research and has discovered that Denise herself was once a student at Wallace University before she dropped out to finish her education at Community College after being rejected as a Kappa Kappa Tau pledge on the basis of her race. The African sorority is Omicron, 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 and their house is down the street. I know, I don't want to be a member of the Ooh House. Look at me. <laughs> I want to be a Kappa. <laughs> I don't think you'd like it here at Kappa House. The ladies rest both of their cases for the time being, but it's clear they both suspect each other of being the Red Devil. Denise Hemphill has her eyes on you. Later, the Chanel's pass around some horrendously racist flyers advising their peers not to attend Zayde's haunted house. I've never actually paused the episode to read the flyers until doing this deep dive, and Jesus Christ, was all of this necessary? Later, Hester meets Chad at the haunted house and delivers one of the most insane lines of the show. Do you think you're man enough to take me inside that house and attack my crack? I guarantee you I'm man enough for that. Inside the haunted house, they find what they at first think is a wax figure of Mrs. Bean, before Hester sticks her finger inside the decomposing leg and they realize that she's the real deal. Miss Bean is laid out on a bed with a tombstone that reads Mrs. Bean in another clear homage to Halloween. Chad accidentally activates a Murphy bed with Shondell's body inside of it, and as they attempt to escape the haunted house, they come across the bodies of Coney, Chanel Number no. 2, and Mandy Green well. Chad tries to warn some of the students about the dead bodies at the haunted house, but that only piques their interest. Do not go to the haunted house on Shady Lane. Yeah. There are dead bodies. Dead bodies. Did you okay. say dead bodies? Dude, yeah. that sounds awesome. Come on, everybody! Let's go to the haunted house on Shady Lane! <laughs> Zayde, Grace, and Pete arrive at their haunted house to find that it's already packed with visitors talking about the dead bodies. Zayde tries to kick them out and call the police, but it's no use. Well, of course they're dead bodies. It's a haunted house. I'm sorry, but that does sound awesome. This scene also has a subtle connection to American Horror Story Coven, as a handful of the frat guys in attendance at Zayde's haunted house are wearing shirts from the Kappa Lambda Gamma fraternity, which is the same one that Kyle Spencer from AHS Coven was a member of. Still having trouble with the 911 operator, Zayde ends up face to face with the Red Devil, who then kidnaps her. Later, Dean Munch once again downplays the recent events to the authorities, and Chanel has a bit of a dramatic reaction to hearing about Mrs. Bean's death. Who apparently has been dead for a few weeks and also- What? Not Miss Bean, no, no! <laughs> They were very close. The episode ends with Grace and Pete theorizing that the hag of Shady Lane is connected to the events surrounding the baby in the bathtub since the hag first started stealing milk from milkmen one month after Sophia Doyle's death. So Grace thinks that the hag of Shady Lane was taking care of Sophia's baby. The episode then confirms to the audience exactly who the hag of Shady Lane is, and it's none other than, drumroll, <laughs> Gigi Caldwell. And you didn't see it coming. No, you didn't see it coming. Didn't see it coming, coming. This whole Halloween arc in episodes four, five, and six is really strong, and these episodes really define the first half of this season. And they also get the mystery moving along with several compelling new developments. This episode's got some of my favorite comedic moments, as well as a genuinely chilling murder in a trailer, and it also pays tribute to the ones that we've lost so far albeit in a pretty morbid way. At this point, the show has really come into its own and both the writers and the actors are fully relaxing into these characters and its shows. And at this point in the season, the show is excelling in every department.
Okay. We are now on the second Halloween episode of season one, that being episode five entitled Pumpkin Patch. The episode opens with the Chanel's planning their pumpkin patch fundraiser, and Chanel has demanded the other Chanel's to secure some high profile guests for the occasion. Number three says she accidentally booked both Fergies of the Black Eyed Peas and the Duchess of York, and number five confesses that her attempts at nabbing Led Zeppelin proved to be fruitless as, to both of their surprise, one of them has been long deceased. Okay, well, it's not my fault that some guy died in the 70s. Excuse me, then whose fault is it? Mine? Then Chanel enters her closet dressed as Jackie Kennedy. Why are you so depressed? My husband was shot in Dallas, idiot. And she reveals to the Chanel's that this year they will all be dressing as first ladies of fallen presidents. Hester gets assigned Ida McKinley, number three gets Lucretia Garfield, and number five gets Mary Todd Lincoln. Number three protests her assignment and Chanel widens the scope of the theme, and number three jumps at the opportunity to be Nancy Reagan. Whatever floats your boat, girl. Then, after taking offense to Chanel's assertion that number five is the epitome of a Mary Todd Lincoln type, she asserts, I am done with you, Chanel, and I mean it. Chanel then tells number five that it's either Mary Todd or get the heck out. There's the door. There's the door, bitch! The episode then cuts to the Scream Queen's main title sequence, for the first and last time in the show's history. Despite producing this absolute banger of a theme song and title sequence, which I explored in my last video, despite this, the show just never used it again. The title sequence features our main ensemble screaming within a black void, with some appearances by the Red Devil and some significant easter eggs, hints, and misdirects. In the scene that follows, the adults of Kappa House, Gigi West, and Kathy attempt to make a safety plan for the Kappa sisters and the Dicky Dollar Scholars. Grace says that their priority should be locating Zayde, which leads to another underrated exchange between Earl Grey and one of the Roger Dodger twins. Because clearly this fake kidnapping is a play to get the sympathy vote. So gone girl. That is bollocks. No, you're thinking of gravity. Okay, everybody stop! Kathy then announces that she is initiating a campus curfew, thus canceling the pumpkin patch and all other festivities, much to the dismay of everyone else. This is the biggest candle night of the year! I hate you right now! Chad then delivers an all-timer. As our great 60th president, John Kennedy Jr. said, The only thing we have to fear, it's fear itself. Well, in this case, serial murders too. But we're not afraid of either of those things. Uh-uh. After being pissed off to the nth degree, Chanel does what she does best. She takes to her keyboard and writes a strongly worded mass email announcing that her pumpkin patch will still occur to those brave enough to attend. And remember, Chanel Oberlin is above the law. We then see that Jennifer the Candle Vlogger too has a way with persuasive emails as she is writing one to Dean Munch that includes lines like, as you know, it's Halloween. As you also know, you have canceled it. And if you continue down this path, may you burn like the flames of a thousand suns. Hester and Chanel number five walk into Jennifer's room and she shows them her aunt family. The two Chanel's then radicalize Jennifer to turn against Chanel in the upcoming vote for Kappa president. Chanel has a closet full of Peak candles that she lights once and then throws away because they're used. What? Show me. Then in class, Chanel perpetuates more racial stereotypes before Detective Chisholm barges in to arrest her for the murder of Miss Bean. Outside, Chanel number three, Chanel number five, Hester, and Jennifer all watch as Chanel is taken away, strongly suggesting that they turned her in. We then learn what's up with Zayde as the Red Devil is holding her hostage in a deep cellar within his lair, which we get a nice steady cam killer POV shot. As I've said before, those killer POV POV shots are clearly a reference to Black Christmas and Halloween, but this Red Devil cellar that he is holding Zayde in is also very reminiscent of The Silence of the Lambs. Then, after a failed attempt at getting the Kappa girls to help them find Zayde, Grace and Pete resort to asking Wes for help, but they end up walking in on him and Gigi playing a game of patty cake. Hi, we were high, high five. What are you doing? Wes and Gigi vow to help find Zayde, and in prison, Chanel 
tells her new friends about how her father can't bail her out because he's about to endorse Ted Cruz. Moments later though, Chanel is bailed out by none other than Chanel number three. We then learn that Chad has not only slept with all of the Chanel's and the Dean, but he's also done the deed with Denise. Kathy and Denise then bond over their shared experiences before the Zayde search party barges in to demand assistance. Dean Munch then reveals that she's assigned Denise to the case of locating Zayde. Denise Hemfield is gonna find Zayde Williams and then I'm gonna throw her in the slammer for murder in the first. Wes and Gigi also use this as a moment to announce that they are now a couple. What are you, to a couple now? Mm-hmm. Oh. Chanel then confronts number five, revealing that Hester and Jennifer ratted out number five the instant that Chanel was released from prison. The Zayde search party then makes a game plan, and Gigi starts to lead them all on a wild goose chase, but Grace luckily realizes that they can try to track Zayde's phone, and they are successful, to Gigi's annoyance. Number five then takes Roger and Dodger to help her light all of the jack-o'-lanterns in the pumpkin patch, but they ditch her for the maze, and shortly after, after the Red Devil appears with some hedge clippers. The twins reappear and take number five into the maze where they force her to choose which one of them she wants to be with. Why are we doing this right now? Choose number five. Pick a side of the Eiffel Tower. Number five picks Roger, I think, and Dodger proceeds to engage in a chase scene within this maze where he ends up killed off screen. Then the Zayde search party splits up and scopes out the Red Devil's lair. The lights go out and Denise ends up tasing Gigi before Gigi tases the Red Devil. Denise conveniently leaves Gigi alone with a Red Devil still wearing his mask, and by the time she returns, Gigi has a convenient cover story. Also worth noting, Zayde is no longer in the cellar. The Kappa girls who aren't searching for Zayde begin to commence the vote for Kappa presidency, which Chanel states is not breaking the rules while also referring to the American Civil War as the War of Northern Aggression. But just before the voting commences, Zayde struts through the front door, announcing that she escaped from the grasps of the Red Devil. She also reveals that the Red Devil didn't actually hurt her, but instead he tried to win her over with a series of gifts. And when he led her out of the cellar to have a candlelit dinner of her favorite food, Oakland nachos, which by the way don't appear to be a real thing, but they consist of Doritos and chocolate syrup, ingredients which you can see Grace and Zayde buying at the convenience store back in episode 3. In a flashback to Zayde's escape, she tricks the Red Devil and stabs him in the hand with a fork in order to get away. Chanel casts doubt on Zayde's story, but Grace barges in to back Zayde up, despite having no way of knowing the context of the conversation that she was barging in on. The episode then ends with Gigi confronting one of the other Red Devils, discussing how messy the kidnapping of Zayde was, and how, quote, he has to go. He's gotta go. Do you understand me? Good. This episode is one of my favorites. It's another instant of one-liners after one-liners, thanks to characters like Denise, the Chanel's, Chad Radwell, and Gigi. The writing is also getting better as the season goes on, and the satire is becoming more nuanced, and it has slightly more perspective. And again, it's because the writers and the actors are really comfortable with the characters at this point. Honestly, this episode is a classic. I think getting to see the Red Devil's lair, as well as watch Gigi react and adapt as her plan goes awry, adds a really interesting layer of humor and complexity to Gigi's character in this episode. Chanel number no. five's constant beratement is another thing that comes into focus in this episode yet again, and while I do think it makes for some funny moments, I do wish that the first season tried to do some more with the character of Chanel number no. five, tried to develop her character a bit more, or at least portray her as a human being worthy of empathy, as throughout this season she seems to be in a perpetual cycle of being abused by Chanel, and then every once in a while number five runs away from Chanel only to come crawling back. Season two on the other hand does a much better job at writing Chanel number five as a sympathetic character while still having those moments of Chanel clearly just hating the bitch. So that is one of the things that I am excited to talk about once I do do a deep dive on season two. We now find ourselves at episode 6, which is entitled Seven Minutes in Hell, and it is the third and final Halloween episode of season 1. Woo, that was a lot of numbers, sorry about that. But the episode kicks off with the girls voting for who will be the next Kappa president, and the results are in. It's a tie. <laughs> 40 
the candle wax clearly miscounted the votes. Calm down, Chanel. It's not Farty's fault. Chanel throws a dramatic tantrum, but in private, Chanel reveals that it was all an act, and she actually cast her vote for Zayde, as she wanted to lose the election. You see, I've learned a few things from watching a &E documentaries about the Mafia. You never, ever want to be the boss in a time of extreme crisis. Chanel then descends the staircase with the key to the secret basement room, symbolically handing over the Kappa presidency to Zayde. I may be a stone-cold bitch, but I love Kappa, and I wanted to survive these challenging times. And I say let's give the Zayde administration a chance. Zayde and Grace devise a plan to throw a slumber party filled with party games in order to figure out if one of their sorority sisters may be the Red Devil. And when they pitch this to the house, everyone is more or less on board. Meanwhile, the Dickie Dollar Scholars are having their own slumber party where Earl Grey proposes a panty raid. So I propose a panty raid. All those in favor! The what? I said, I guess you're gonna miss the panty raid. Panty raid! At the Kappa slumber party, Chanel number three demands that they all play spin the bottle, and she's not happy till she's kissed Sam. They do, and afterwards they meet each other in the bathroom for some good old fashioned bonding. Hey. Chanel number three opens up about the true reason why she always wears earmuffs. The guy I dated here last year got so obsessed with my ears he had to leave school. Now he writes me letters threatening to cut them off if he ever sees them again, which is why I always wear my earmuffs. I understand. But again, this clearly wasn't always a part of number three's backstory, since there are still a handful of scenes in episodes one and two where number three is not wearing her earmuffs. And then Chanel number three delivers a line that I once tried and failed to get to be my senior quote in high school. If it was possible for me to feel anything, I would totally be crying right now. The girls then realize that all of the doors and windows have been locked, and they are all trapped inside of the Kappa mansion. He must have hacked into the failsafe security system I had installed. Meanwhile, Hester's still doing her best at keeping things inconspicuous. There's only one reason why the killer would do something like this, to pick us off one by one. That's what I would do. Chad confesses his affairs with Kathy and Denise to Chanel before vowing to commit to Chanel and come to her rescue. Chanel tells Chad that she loves him and Chad says, I love you too, sort of. <laughs> Chad then climbs up to Chanel's bedroom window where she's there scaring him away with more relationship talk. Oh, Chad, you've come for me. Save me and I'm yours forever. Ah. I'm not really sure I'm ready for that level of commitment. Once inside, Chad spots the Red Devil and orders the rest of the scholars to hurry their asses up inside. Everyone makes it up except for Caulfield, who unfortunately loses his head. R.I.P. Oh, he's going! Ah! Zayde and Grace then initiate their game of truth or dare, where Jennifer and Chad get into it over the rules of the game. But wouldn't you just lie? I mean, if I were the killer, I'd pick truth and then just lie. If you want to lie, you can just pick dare. No. Pick truth and then you lie. It's the whole point of truth or dare, you can't lie. But- I'm sorry, the game's pretty damn simple, okay? It's truth or dare. Chanel then asks number five for the first time. Does your have teeth? <laughs> insane. Grace then asks Sam what number three's darkest secret is, and Sam says without hesitation that number three's father is Charles Manson. At the same time, Chanel number three admits that she has romantic feelings for Sam, but clearly now she's having second thoughts. Number three's feelings get brushed under the rug as everyone else collectively raises an eyebrow in her direction. Your dad's Charles Manson, dude. If you're not the killer, you should probably don't give it a shot. I think you'd be pretty good at it. As revenge, Chanel number three dares Sam to go down to the basement and take a nap in the infamous bathtub. Sam does this and is later killed via suffocation with a plastic bag by the Red Devil, which has got to be a bit of a Black Christmas nod. Hester then follows up with Chad on their recent romance, and based on his previous conversation with Chanel, Chad rejects her, which Hester is not pleased about. I don't stop till I get what I want. What's going on in here? 
Nothing, Chanel. Chanel then proposes that they all play seven minutes in heaven, but Grace says that goes against the whole point of the slumber party. The whole point of this slumber party was to figure out who the killer is. I'll give it a rest, Nancy Drew. Emma Roberts, of course, once played Nancy Drew in the 2007 adaptation of the book series. In the closet, Chanel tells Chad she wants to take the relationship to the next level, and to her surprise, Chad is down. Then I think about the good things about you, like, how gullible you are, how rich your dad is. When I think about that girl, the really rich one who's easy to track, I think she's pretty special too. Chad. Chad and Chanel then engage in a pinky to pinky meeting, sorry, I mean a pinky promise, to stay monogamous. Chanel number five and Roger then go into the closet for their seven minute session, and just then, Hester screams from the basement where she has found Sam's dead body, something that Grace and Chanel then claim is mighty convenient. Chanel number five then watches in stunned silence as the Red Devil sneaks up behind Roger and shoots him thrice in the head with a nail gun before proceeding to fill his entire face with nails in a bloodless and far less disturbing version of this exact thing happening more or less in American Horror Story cult. Due to recent events, Chanel amends her previous Hester accusation, and she's now convinced that Chanel number five is the Red Devil. But as Chad points out, they all know that there have to be at least two Red Devils. There were two devils. Dos Diablos. Chad then finds a secret entrance to a tunnel system within the mansion, which Chanel has apparently known about this whole time. Zayde says that those tunnels are probably their only way out, so she and Chanel venture down to try to get some help. Within these tunnels, Chanel gives Zayde an oral history of all of the past Kappa presidents, as this secret tunnel is where all of their portraits hang. All of their portraits include a very similar pennant as the one that Grace has from her mother, but history class gets cut short short as the Red Devil is coming and he's coming fast. Zayde trips and Chanel leaves her for dead, but Zayde ducks and dodges the Devil's axes like an action star before ending up cornered. Chanel returns, knocks the Red Devil out, and the Kappa co-presidents escape the tunnels together. Again, it's rare, but every once in a while, this season makes a point to humanize Chanel Oberlin, or to at least make her less of a supervillain. Later, Pete texts Grace, and in a weird oversight, the date on Grace's phone says that it's July 30th, 2015, despite this episode canonically taking place shortly after Halloween night. Wes barges in and demands that Grace leave school, but she refuses to do that. Meanwhile, number five and number three empathize with each other, having both just lost their romantic interest. Chanel number three also explains to number five her own sexuality by essentially reciting the definition of pansexuality. When I kissed her, I realized I didn't care if she was a girl or a guy. Basically, I'm in love with love. And honestly, that is the best piece of LGBT representation that we're gonna get in this season, so eat up. All of that aside, I love this scene between number three and number five, and as I've said, these two's dynamics are something that always shine, especially on the off chance that they're given scenes alone together. Then, Grace professes her undying sisterhood. Guys, I joined this sorority to feel close to my mom, to get a taste of the sisterhood that she was so inspired by. And after last night, I really feel it. I'm with you guys, no matter what. <laughs> Thank you for making that announcement that no one cared about. And just like any family movie from the 80s, 90s, or 2000s, this episode ends with a dance party. What a great way to pretend all these people we know weren't brutally murdered. There's nothing you and I won't do. This episode is another really strong one, although I do wish it had a stronger focus on the Halloween elements, considering it is the third Halloween episode of the season. That said, the characters really shine in this one, as they're all locked inside together and forced to interact with one another, and the stakes finally feel like they're starting to ramp up, as not one, not two, but three characters bite the dust in this episode. And all three of them were given pretty ambitious and effective death scenes. Tonally, I think this episode, and all of the Halloween episodes for that matter, nail the balance between comedy and horror better than the episodes that came before it, which of course attempted to ease the viewers in with more grounded presentations of characters like Zayde or Grace. But again, like I said with the last episode, for this episode as well, the show is really functioning exactly as it should. Another piece of bonus material that was uploaded to the Scream Queens YouTube channel throughout season one was this game of Truth or Dare played by Kiki Palmer, Billy Lord, Abigail Breslin, and Diego Bonetta. And to be honest, it's got some really cringy stuff in there. I went to the store, I was like, why? You know, I'm getting honey. Who's that? No, no! Diego! That's Diego! 
Oh, yes. That has what? no the... Latin flame to oh, it. Because I'm not Latin. Well, he is. I know. But yeah, but I'm also not like, oh, I want to make I a know. love to you. Yes, Latin. you are all oh, the time. Oh, Every day you're like, oh, baby, oh, oh, how are you doing today? But aside from the cringy stuff, there's also some wholesome moments, like this moment of Kiki and Abigail bonding over their music careers. A little verse of your first single. There's a difference between me you and these sheets, yeah. I don't belong to you. Keep it on the down low. Oh, oh. There's my girl! Oh. Uh, Abby. Love I dare you to sing the first couple of verses See, of your Abby. song again. Don't think a couple texts in the car or two is gonna win me, it's gonna win me back. Yeah! I must say, as a massive Scream Queens fan, I did follow the music careers of both Kiki Palmer and Abigail Breslin, and I genuinely am a big fan of a lot of their music. Kiki Palmer's Lauren EP, which came out around the time of season two, holds a similarly nostalgic place in my heart as this show does, and all of the songs are genuinely really catchy. Since then though, Kiki has released a lot more music, and honestly she just keeps getting better and better, and I highly recommend both of her Virgo tendencies albums, and Abigail Breslin has been releasing music under the name Sophomore, and while she doesn't have the largest discography, songs like Sleepwalking, Witchcraft, and her latest Love on Loan are all really good and have me asking, where is the album? But now, let's move on to Scream Queens Season 1, Episode 7, entitled Beware of Young Girls, which starts with a surprise return of an old friend, as we are gathered here today to celebrate the life and times of none other than Sonia Herfman, or as you may know her Chanel number two. It's too bad you had to die before we found out what ethnicity you are. Chanel number two's funeral is one of the most memorable moments from the show, thanks to Chanel's speech being a vast array of pointed one-liners and also some exceptional set dressing and costume design. Whenever I find myself descending a staircase in heels, you can bet number two is right there behind me with a helpful little nudge. <laughs> Oops, sorry, Chanel. Chanel number two is then rolled off to be cremated and shot into space, and the episode continues with the Chanel's convincing Chanel to try and contact number two with a Ouija board. Didn't you see the movie? The movie Ouija? No, no one did. Hey, I saw that movie. Through the Ouija board, Chanel number two reveals that Chad is cheating on Chanel, but Chanel is not buying it. Later, Gigi takes a call from the mysterious unrevealed Red Devil, whose name rhymes with Schmester, where Gigi is furious that she hasn't killed her brother yet. We are not kidnappers. We are murderers hell-bent on revenge. I told you this. That is our brand. Wes comes home and interrupts Gigi's evil monologuing, and I must reiterate just how perfectly cast Nassim Pedrad is in this role. Grace and Gigi later go shopping together to bond and to get Gigi some clothes from this decade, and when Grace isn't looking, it's abundantly clear that Gigi absolutely can't stand her. And that guy deserves a girl who doesn't dress like Brenda Walsh. <laughs> Gigi mentions a character by the name of Feather McCarthy, who she says may have some crucial information to crack Grace and Pete's case. We then meet Feather, who is played by Tavi Gevinson, and she is immediately ready to point fingers at Dean Munch. Feather's backstory is that she was once a student at Wallace University and a Kappa sister, back when Kathy Munch's ex-husband was still her current husband, and he was teaching a Beatles class at the university. Feather was enrolled in his class, and that's when she and Kathy's husband fell in love. Essentially, this tore apart Kathy's marriage, and she proceeded to stalk Feather, perfectly replicate her outfits, and even got her kicked out of Kappa Kappa Tau. And the most incriminating part of Feather's story is that she believes that Kathy broke into her home and pushed a transistor radio into her bathtub, attempting to murder her via electrocution, which just so happened to be the exact same way the ex-dean of Wallace University died. Feather then returns home to find a series of bloody directions pointing towards her boyfriend's decapitated head in a fish tank. Rest in peace, guy. Speaking of Feather, in some more Scream Queens bonus content, actress Tavi Gevinson talks about her experience being discovered by Ryan Murphy and playing the role of Feather McCarthy. Ryan saw me in a play that I did called This Is Our Youth in New York last year and then called me when they were starting to work on the show and said that he had this character in mind for me. So I was just sort of like, whatever you want, it'll be super fun. 
Based on Chanel number two's accusation from the great beyond, Chanel storms into the Dicky Dollar Scholar house, where she ends up walking in on Chad in bed with a goat. Chad then reveals a deep, dark secret. <sighs> I'm lactose intolerant. This is insane. No, it's not insane, Chanel. He is simply trying to relax the goat in order to milk it. Chanel apologizes and says this was all number two's fault. Look, you just can't let dead people get to you. Okay, they're super pissed off they're dead, so they're coming from a place of anger. Kathy then nurses a knee injury and explains how it happened to Detective Chisholm. She says that she was so drunk that she fell down a flight of stairs in her apartment. But Chisholm notes that Kathy doesn't have stairs, and Kathy says, Well, that shows you how drunk I was. I hallucinated a flight of stairs. Kathy then subtly reveals that she and Chisholm have been romantically involved, while Chisholm begins to connect some dots that cause him to place Kathy under arrest for the murder of her ex-husband. Kathy gets carried away in a straitjacket as Feather seethes nearby. Grace and Pete map out all of the murders, and it's pretty clear that almost every murder happens at Kappa House, thanks to its secret tunnel system allowing the house to essentially be a murder trap. Honestly, this map is evidence alone that these girls need to move into temporary housing, or at least weld the exits and entrances to the tunnel system shut. But Grace and Pete just ignore this fact, and Pete really is pushing for the idea that Kathy is the true Red Devil, and Grace goes along with this theory, and they celebrate that they've solved the Red Devil case, despite it being common knowledge at this point that there are definitely at least two killers. Dos Diablos! The half-true detectives then share a smooch, but just then, Grace gets a call from Dean Munch from the mental hospital, and she requests that Grace and Pete come visit her the following day. So, that next day, Grace Grace and Pete arrive at Palmer Asylum, where once inside, the camera gets intensely fluid and canted in what I believe to be a subtle visual homage to AHS Asylum. Grace and Peter. Grace. Peter. Then talk with a somewhat sedated Kathy, who tells them about one woman who has painted every patient who has entered this hospital for the past 30 years. I paint them all. She also says that she knows that Feather is the true culprit of her ex-husband's murder, while also accidentally admitting to trying to kill Feather by pushing a radio into her back. You know, I knew she was no good as soon as I saw her in that bathtub. I don't trust a girl with a huge bush of pubic hair. Kathy then yells at a worker for bringing her a bologna sandwich, which she makes abundantly clear she is deathly allergic to. On their way out, Grace and Pete are stopped by the woman who paints them all. I paint them all and she has already painted a huge portrait of the two of them. Our half-true detectives then go over the evidence found at the murder scene of Kathy's ex-husband, and one of those pieces of evidence just so happens to be a half-eaten bologna sandwich, which to them clearly exonerates Kathy from killing her ex. That is, if you're just taking her word for it. Grace and Peter then collect some of Feather's DNA to cross-reference it to the bologna sandwich DNA. Meanwhile, of course, Pete knows that this all has nothing to do with with the Red Devil murders. This whole theme of Pete putting himself and Grace on these wild goose chases is very ingenious because on the surface when you're watching the season for the first time, it may seem like this pair getting so far off track from the Red Devils is just a way to fill these middle episodes with misdirections and filler, and while that is certainly true in part, we will soon learn that this was all done with intention by Pete, and thus when you rewatch this season knowing it, these wild goose chases don't feel too much like filler, knowing that this is all Pete's intentional attempt to throw Grace off of his and the other Red Devils' sense. The Chanel's then contact Chanel number two using their spirit board once again, and the girls clearly did not read the instructions because they keep removing their damn fingers from the planchette, and god knows they're letting in all sorts of demons. Chanel asks number two who is killing everyone, and number two says that it's Chanel. Deep. The other Chanel's then privately plot ways to kill Chanel. Meanwhile, Chanel puts herself to sleep with some laxatives that also make you sleepy? I don't know. But it is in this laxative-induced slumber that she is visited by none other than the ghost of Chanel number two in what is Ariana Grande's final scene in the series, and also one of my all-time favorites. Hey Chanel, it's Chanel number two. Yeah, I know who you are. Chanel number two tells Chanel that hell is not all that it's made out to be. Zero dinosaurs. There's no dinosaurs? No. 
As soon as I got there, I was like, where are the dinosaurs? Number two also apologizes to Chanel, and Chanel returns the favor before number two warns Chanel that the others are plotting to kill her in her sleep. Number two leaves Chanel with a pep talk, and just like that, she's gone. I'm gonna go. Grace, Pete, and Detective Chisholm deduce that Feather's DNA is a match for the bologna sandwich. I guess all that killing and dismembering and pretending that it wasn't her made her hungry, but not that hungry. Kathy walks in, having been proven sort of innocent, and she presents a case against Feather. Chanel then confronts the Chanel's about their secret plan to kill her, and she extends an olive branch to each of them in the form of Nancy Drew-esque detective outfits so that they can all catch the killer together, since she says that Feather's too dumb to be the real killer, and... There are two killers, and their names are Grace and Zayday. Kathy dances around her apartment while her narration reveals that she just got away with murder. Take that, Annalise Keating. Yes, that's right. Kathy Munch was the true killer of her ex-husband, dismembering him and writing clues in his blood and everything. This is an easy detail to forget about because it doesn't really come up too much, but wow. This is also not her first time killing, as this episode alleges that she killed the previous university dean, and of course she attempted to kill Feather, and then ultimately, brutally, killed her Beatles loving ex husband. The episode then ends with Feather locked up and the Chanel's setting their sights on Grace and Zede. In terms of propelling the mystery forward, this episode definitely takes a sharp left turn, instead, focusing on Dean Munch, Feather McCarthy, and the man they both loved. It's the most Jamie Lee Curtis centric episode thus far, and having her be revealed to be capable of such dark things adds a really interesting layer to her character that definitely has echoes throughout the rest of season one, but I will say it is one of the things that I think they conveniently forgot going into season two. Aside from the feather plot, the episodes also got some very memorable Chanel moments with the unexpected return of Chanel number two, and while Grace and Pete do some very inconsequential investigation work in this episode, Episode. Like I said earlier, the hidden intentions of Pete that are later revealed in the season add an extra sinister flair to each of these scenes where Pete is knowingly misleading Grace. One small critique I have for this episode is that it is one of the few episodes without Denise Hemphill, and I feel like she makes any episode stronger just by being in it because she is such an integral ingredient to the show's formula. Overall, this was a really strong episode that gives the Red Devil storyline some breathing room with a fresh and interesting new storyline, and it is one of the reasons why the middle of this season is paced so well. Moving on to episode 8, entitled Mommy Dearest, in a reference to this episode having a theme of mothers, and of course the title is also a direct reference to Christina Crawford's memoir about her mother Joan Crawford, which was adapted into an infamous film by the same name. The episode starts with one of the show's most popular clips commonly used out of context on Twitter. <laughs> Kathy dodges Grace's questions about the baby in the bathtub, and she instead insists that Feather is the Red Devil killer, and the case actually had nothing to do with what happened in 1995. Then, back at her apartment, Kathy engages in a shot-by-shot -shot remake of the shower scene from Psycho. Only when the killer opens the shower curtain, she's already behind him. I saw that movie 50 times.
This is, of course, an homage to the 1960 film that arguably started the American slasher subgenre, but it also is a nod to Jamie Lee Curtis's mother, Janet Lee, who played the iconic role of Marion Crane in Psycho. This reference is meta in so many ways because not only is Psycho the birth of the slasher subgenre in which Scream Queens is parodying in and of itself, obviously Jamie Lee Curtis has such a rich connection to the subgenre as well, and her mother Janet Lee originated the the trope, I guess, of having a actor or actress being advertised as a lead in a horror movie only to have them killed off very early on, which of course happens to Marion Crane halfway through Psycho, and then of course Drew Barrymore in Scream dying within the first 15 minutes itself is an homage to Psycho, and in Scream Queens, Ariana Grande being advertised as one of the main Chanel's throughout the show's marketing material also feels like a reference to both Drew Barrymore in Scream and Janet Lee in Psycho as as well. Kathy then has trouble with the 911 operator. 911 is for emergencies only. If you need a ride to the store or McDonald's got your order wrong, please hang up. So she must face off with the Red Devil herself, but unluckily for her, a second Red Devil shows himself too. To make matters even worse, a third killer appears. Only this one's dressed as Supreme Court Justice Antonin Scalia. <laughs> Wait a minute, are, are you supposed to be Supreme Court Justice Antonin Scalia? Notably, this is the first time the killers have come face to face with Kathy, the person who in theory is the whole reason they're killing these people, since we'll eventually learn that this whole Red Devil plan spawned from the cover-up of Sophia's death, which was spearheaded by Kathy. Kathy reveals some kick-ass martial arts skills and she takes down all three Red Devils. Well, two Red Devils and one Antonin Scalia. lifestyle is not destructive to the fabric of American society. The Voting Rights Act should be authorized in every state, and the Affordable Care Act does not require people to eat broccoli. It goes without saying, it happens in tons of other films as well, but gosh darn it, now would be the perfect time to solve everyone's problems and just unmask all three of these idiots. Instead, the killers just cowardly scurry away, and they never try to kill Kathy again in the season, which is crazy. The Chanel's then regroup to share their own personal evidence-based theories on who the Red Devil killers actually are. Hester has a flimsy theory against Grace and Zayde. Those who pill together, kill together. No one in all of human history has ever said that. Chanel number no. five then delivers a theory against Zayde that is so dumb, but it never fails to make me laugh. If you rearrange the letters in Zayde Williams' name, you get, I may slay Liz Daw. What? Who is Liz Daw? I don't know, but clearly Zayde is contemplating slaying her. Denise Hemphill returns and reveals that she is now living in Chanel number no. two's room since she's tired of sleeping in the patrol car outside. Chanel number no. three asks Denise to name the biggest number she can imagine Imagine. One million dollars. That's seriously the largest number you can imagine? Three million dollars. Okay, fine. And number three agrees to pay Denise three million dollars if she can prove that Zayde is actually the killer. Then, after much back and forth, Dean Munch reveals to Grace that the woman who died in the Kappa bathtub was Sophia Doyle. Expecting to hear her own mother's name, Grace is disappointed. Later, Jennifer the candle vlogger erupts with a threat. Crap, I'm gonna kill that dumb bitch! Bro, what dumb bitch you gonna kill? Girl at Candle Junction, who evidently doesn't understand the concept of a 22 for the price of 20 sales. Later, Jennifer continues to air Candle Junction out on her channel, but at the end of the day, the product wins her over as she rates the final candle five stars before she is stabbed in the head by the Red Devil. Rest in peace, Jennifer. I truly can't believe you lasted eight episodes. Jennifer's body, no pun intended, is then discovered by the screaming queens themselves, set up in a candle display that surely Jennifer herself would appreciate. Grace tells Pete that her spirituality and her intuition is telling her that her mother is connected to all of this, and the pair then return to the mental hospital to pry some more about the hag of Shady Lane, the woman who paints them all I paint them all. 
does in fact have a portrait of the Hag of Shady Lane, and when she reveals it to them, it comes with some major curveballs for Grace and Pete's investigation. First of all, the Hag is Gigi, and second of all, there were two babies, which she says were a boy and a girl. Dean Munch then holds a press conference, finally admitting the existence of a serial killer targeting the campus, and so she has decided to suspend all classes and on-campus activities. A beautiful vigil in Jennifer's honor is held, and meanwhile, Chanel has hired two Scottish policemen to help her nail down Grace and Zayde as the two killers. Grace then confronts Gigi with the portrait from the hospital, but Gigi plays it cool. It's so weird, it does kind of look like me. What's with the two babies, though? Gigi then uses Grace's mommy issues against her and successfully gets inside her head by revealing that she and Wes are engaged. Chanel's Scottish cops reveal number five's real name is Libby Putney and that she's been plotting to kill Chanel on the dark web. However, when it comes to Grace or Zayde, they don't seem to be involved with the killings. However, they have managed to dig up some dirt on Grace's mother. Looks like the bitch apple doesn't fall far from the bitch tree. Grace then goes to Wes, and Wes explains that Gigi was the one who bought herself the ring, despite Wes never actually proposing, but nonetheless, he went along with it to make her happy, but he is not buying Grace's pitch that Gigi has lost her marbles. Grace begins to lose trust in her father and suspect that he may know more about 1995 than he admits. Once she gets back to the Kappa house, Grace is stopped by Chanel, who hands over Grace's mother's criminal record. Grace's mother has been someone we actually knew from episode episode 1. It's the Waterfalls loving Kappa president from the opening scene of the show, Bethany. And that very night when Sophia Doyle gave birth and died was when Bethany first hooked up with Wes Gardner. Meaning, while Grace was not born that night in the bathtub, it's very likely that that was the night she was conceived. Chanel says that after the cover-up, Bethany changed her name to Mary Mulligan, but it was also around this time that she began racking up bullet points on her criminal record. However, the thing Chanel alleges Bethany did would have certainly put her in prison for probably life, but Chanel just says that things like drunk driving with a baby on the roof of your car only caused Bethany to lose custody of Grace. And yes, of course, Wes was lying about Grace's mother having died in a fire, as Bethany would actually die a year after Wes won custody of Grace in a drunk driving related accident. I guess the police department in this town has been completely dysfunctional since the 90s because there's no way in hell this woman should have been allowed behind and a wheel. Chanel herself gets a bit drunk with power, and Grace delivers the most satisfying slap of the series. Then, Denise is making herself comfortable now that she's living inside of the Kappa house, wearing number five's clothing, and declaring herself house mother. I am house mother, and as house mother, I can do whatever I want. House mother? What are you talking about? Chanel, it's a coup. Denise then tells Chanel she needs to apologize to Grace. Over my rich, hot, dead body. But Denise gives her an ultimatum. Chanel will apologize to Grace, or Denise will steal Chad Radwell. Wes then confirms that Bethany was Grace's mother, but he says his story of a house fire was also true. He burned down their home in an attempt to destroy all of Bethany's belongings so that Grace wouldn't find out about her true identity. Right. Right, right, because that makes it better. Rightfully so, Grace storms out, but just then, Gigi enters and reveals to Wes that Grace is allegedly failing out of college. And Gigi says, You don't start taking some real action, maybe even committing her or something, then you are really failing her as a father. Grace and Chanel then meet at the grind, where Chanel apologizes to Grace and reveals that her mother was no saint either. We then get a flashback to Chanel's childhood. Turns out she's been dressing like this since way back then, despite Chanel number no. 5 claiming to have originated her style. Pink fur coats, worn in all weather, <laughs> my idea. Flapper dresses made out of feathers, also my idea. Oversized swing glasses worn everywhere, my idea, my idea, my idea! Chanel says that she wanted to mold Kappa into the mother she never had, but Grace says that no, she actually turned Kappa into the mother she did have, as it's clearly a toxic wasteland of a myriad of her own mother's damaging behaviors. Later at the gym, Boone reappears wearing a fake beard as a disguise, but this disguise backfires as the entire gym ends up thinking he's actor Joaquin Phoenix. On the phone with a secret Hester, he plots that the two of them kill Gigi. 
This episode is wild. It's got some of the series' comedic highs, as well as its most dramatic and serious moments and performances, but surprisingly, it all works. Nassim Pedrad shines here, playing a more dark and more manipulative Gigi, fully selling the character of being capable of such an evil master plan, and Skylar Samuels as well showcases a ton of emotional range with all of her scenes in this episode as well. This one also takes us back to 1995 once again to make some huge revelations about Grace's mother. Again, I've got no complaints with this episode, and the middle section of Scream Queen Season 1 really locks in and delivers episode after episode. Episode 9 is entitled Ghost Stories, and it picks up where the last episode left off, with Boone taking a stroll through campus in his disguise, still on the phone with Hester, plotting to kill Gigi. Boone spills a drink on his fake beard, so he ends up ripping it off, just as Chanel number 3 passes by. Lucky for Boone, number 3 thinks she must be seeing a ghost. Okay, caught me. I'm a ghost. Yeah. Number three later reveals to the Chanel's and Denise that the ghost of dead gay Boone is haunting her. Late last night, I was walking around campus and I saw the ghost of dead gay Boone. The ghost of dead gay Boone is walking the earth. Inspired by number three's ghost story, Denise decides that they must all gather around the fireplace to share some more. Denise name drops some ghost stories and urban legends like the Candyman or the lady with the hairy arms. Just like hers, who disappears when you- Denise then tells the girls a Japanese story called the Kappa about a sewer monster who snatches you down through the toilet. After the girls say that Denise's stories are only making them more scared, Denise says that they just need to hear some more. So she tells them another Japanese ghost story about a ghost who lurks in women's restrooms. Why another story about a bathroom? I'm just telling the story. This story is about a ghost that makes you choose between a red roll of toilet paper or a blue one, and whichever one you pick will determine how the ghost will kill you. Elsewhere, the ghost of dead gay Boone haunts Chad Radwell to ask him for his date shirt since he still plans on wooing Zayde. Don't you forget you're super gay. <laughs> Um, yeah, but I don't want to be dead anymore, bro. Boone convinces Chad that the only way he can be alive again is if he goes on this date with Zayde, and it has nothing to do with his sexuality. But as the show later clarifies, Boone was actually faking his gay identity as another one of his dumb ideas to make himself inconspicuous. Denise goes to the restroom where she is confronted with the same decision from her earlier ghost story. But before she can decide her fate, the Red Devil gets impatient and begins strangling her. The pair brawl a bit and Denise even dunks the Red Devil's head in the toilet before managing to get away. Denise runs to inform the Chanel's, but instead of them all vacating the premises, Denise declares that they must hear another ghost story, otherwise she'll be too frightened to leave. Hester says she's up for the challenge and she begins telling the urban legend about there being a killer in your back seat. Ryan Murphy must love this urban legend because it gets brought up again in American Horror Story 1984, and it even has its own American Horror Stories episode based around the same premise. Denise says that Hester's story did the trick, and she's now ready to get the heck out of Kappa. Chanel warns that the killer might still be in the house, so they're better off locked inside this room, but number five decides that she's making a run for it. Let's wait in here if she makes it downstairs to make sure the killer isn't still here. Zayde and Earl Grey have their first kiss, but before things can get too steamy, Earl says that he must go back to the Dickey house to get his supplies. Just when he leaves, not dead, not gay Boone climbs through Zayde's window. I thought you were dead. Yes, I am his ghost. I'm Ghost Boone, but you can just call me Boone. Boone tries his best to woo Zayde with his whole ghost act, but Zayde says, I don't believe in ghosts. Grace enters just as Zayde accuses Boone of faking his death, and the two of them accuse him of being the Red Devil, with the most damning piece of evidence being the fork wound still in his hand from when Zayde stabbed him in his lair. Grace and Zayde attempt to apprehend Boone, but he ends up falling through the window, and just like Michael Myers, vanishes. <laughs> Thank you. 
This marks the first scene between Grace and Boone, which is something Skylar Samuels had been anticipating all season long, as when she was younger, she once had a strong affinity for the Jonas Brothers. Did you ever tell him your Jonas Brothers story? No! I got so nervous. Okay, so in episode nine, there was a scene where he crawls through the window of Zadie and Grace's room, and I just remember I was like, okay, today's the day. Got my first scene with Nick. I've been waiting this out several months, but like at the end of the show, I should must up the courage and say something and I just couldn't do it. I was just like, I'm playing it so cool, I shouldn't break my cover. Although part of me really feels like he must have heard this somewhere. I might have to face the truth and tell him one day, but I chickened out. We soon learned that Boone didn't vanish, he instead scurried somewhere else to put on his Red Devil costume so he could confront Earl Grey. The whole costume change proves to be pretty pointless though, because he decides to unmask himself and then kill Earl Grey. Rest in peace. Chanel number five drives away from campus when she hears a radio report about Boone being on the loose. Boone is very handsome, but police are requesting you not approach him as he may be dangerous. He also may or may not be gay. Now, back to the Go-Go's. Number five then experiences the urban legend earlier about the killer in the back seat as Boone turned out to be a stowaway in her back seat. After pulling over, Boone kills the driver who warned number five as number five makes her lucky escape. We then get a rather large hint towards the third Red Devil's identity as Hester gets her own killer steadicam POV shot as she ventures through the Dickie Dollar Scholar house to confront Chad. Hester's wearing her neck brace again, claiming that her spine is collapsing. She is upset that Chad's chosen Chanel to spend Thanksgiving with, and she leaves him with an ominous message. I guess we'll just have to see how it goes bringing Chanel home for Thanksgiving. Yeah, we will wait and see, as Thanksgiving is an event that takes place in the future, and therefore it hasn't happened yet. We'll see. Yep, sure will, as the arrow of time flows in one direction, causing future events to flow inexorably towards us. Later, the Chanel's Zayde and Grace all theorize on the other killer's identities now that they know that one of the devils is Boone. But they are quickly interrupted by Hester, who reveals, Bitch, I'm pregnant! Chanel then confronts Chad, who says this must be true, and because of the pregnancy, he must now bring Hester home to Thanksgiving and also marry her. Chanel then tells number three and number five that they must figure out a way to kill Hester, and they all then debate what it exactly means to be the killer. Chanel, you cannot just run around murdering people, okay? That just means you're the killer. It makes her a killer, not the killer. Grace and Zayde plead for Detective Chisholm to call in the FBI since the local law enforcement is clearly not equipped to deal with the Red Devil. Chisholm confesses that this whole time he has been operating under the hypothesis that the killer is really a ghost, and due to the recent sightings of Boone, he has now decided to call in a paranormal detective, who, by the way, comes with a warning that's gotta be another meta reference to American Horror Story. I must warn you, if your boyfriend was murdered, he may not be ready to pass over and may come pay you a visitation. If that happens, I beg of you, do not have sex with him. Dean Munch then vows to have Chisholm taken off of the case and fired. Then upstairs, Munch tells Grace and Zayde via exposition dump how exactly they managed to cover up the fact that Sophia Doyle had twins. Kathy says that after the other Kappa sisters left the bathroom, Sophia gave birth post-mortem to the second twin, and Kathy never revealed this to the other girls. I knew it. Congratulations on making this moment all about you. Then, three Red Devils have a meeting, Gigi, Boone, and one other who is still in a mask because their identity has yet to be revealed, but in the penultimate episode, it is revealed that the person in this particular costume in the scene is Pete. Gigi then tells Boone just how much of a burden he's been to the plan, and Boone then proceeds to list off his resume. He says that he trained his heartbeat to stop long enough to be declared dead by a coroner, practiced special effects makeup to master his throat prosthetic, pretended to be gay for no reason, and orchestrated Gigi's encounter with the Red Devil back in episode 3. Boone then tells Gigi that it's time for her to die, and Pete raises his blade only to release it in the chest of Boone. The Chanel's then trick Hester into voluntarily eating an array of foods and drinks that pregnant people are not supposed to consume, and Hester falls for it face first. Mmm. Delish. <laughs> What the hell is going on? You're trapped in a web of lies, whore. 
The Chanel's then make Hester take a pregnancy test, which makes Hester confess that she's not actually pregnant. Hester leaves and Chanel storms after her and pushes her down the stairs, knocking her unconscious enough to be presumed dead. Chanel tells the others, Let's get her in that meat locker. And that is how episode 9, Ghost Stories, ends. I know we've been on a hot streak with these episodes, but I'm gonna be honest and say that Ghost Stories doesn't quite check all of my boxes, whereas the previous two episodes similarly took us on side quests separate from the main Red Devil mystery. Those episodes didn't feel like a complete waste of time because they were still chock full of significant twists and character deaths. Ghost Stories, on the other hand, really just puts everything on pause as Denise gathers the girls around the the fireplace to tell some ghost stories. And the rest of the episode pretty much serves entirely as setup for the incredible Thanksgiving episode that follows. That being said, Ghost Stories is not lacking when it comes to comedy, as it is another episode that forces our main ensemble to be locked inside together, which allows for all sorts of humorous backs and forths. And now it is finally time to talk about my all-time favorite episode, Thanksgiving, where Ghost Stories may have put a slight pause on the season's momentum, but by the end of Thanksgiving, we are put back on the fast track, and the episode really feels like the beginning of the end for the Red Devil mystery. So let's just dig right in as Thanksgiving begins with Chanel telling Chad that his Hester dilemma has been solved via stair pushing. Once Chad demands to see Hester's body, they are both surprised to find out that she's gone missing from the freezer. Is this meat locker like a wormhole to an alternate universe or something? But when Chad asks if Chanel even checked Hester's pulse, Chanel says, No, Chad, because I'm not like a registered nurse. Not yet, you aren't. Then in the Red Devil hotel room, Gigi and a masked Red Devil make hand turkeys and watch the Macy's parade while they discuss their decision to kill Boone, something Hester's still not very pleased about. Room service arrives alongside a serrated carver, and the stage is set for a Thanksgiving feast to remember. How about you do the honors? Then, Chanel number 3 arrives at her adopted family's Thanksgiving gathering, which consists of watching football and eating what this family built their fortune off of, frozen dinners. Number 3's family refuses to acknowledge all that she's going through, you know, with 13 of her friends dying at the hands of a serial killer. So rightfully so, number 3 isn't really feeling all that thankful. I'm starting a new family tradition. It involves me never coming to any family occasions ever again. Honey, where are you going? Home. Once she's arrived back at Kappa House, number three is startled by Dean Munch, who is using the kitchen to slaughter and prepare a turkey. Grace and Zayde have also stuck around Kappa House for the holiday, despite having already established how almost every single murder happens inside this mansion because of the tunnel system. Wes complains to Grace on the phone, while also engaging in some not-so-subtle foreshadowing. Where's Gigi? I don't know. She just didn't show up. Then at the Radwell family Thanksgiving in the Hamptons, we are introduced to a rather stacked group of guest stars playing Chad's family. Bunny Radwell, the matriarch, is played by Julia Duffy. Tad Radwell, Chad's father, is played by Alan Thicke. And then Chad's brother, Thad, is played by Patrick Schwarzenegger. And his brother, Brad, is played by Chad Michael Murray. Bunny throws one too many passive-aggressive remarks Chanel's way, and in response, Chanel gets full-on aggressive. But you should be thankful that this table is too long for me to reach across and strangle you, bitch! Before the festivities are interrupted by the arrival of an unexpected guest, Hester. Hester announces to the family that she is pregnant with Chad's baby, which is obviously not true. Bunny sees right through Hester and berates her even worse than she did Chanel. Then, the orphans back at Kappa House play a game where they discuss their theories about the other Red Devil. Wes is here now, and so is number five, who reveals that she tried to go home for Thanksgiving, only to find out that her whole family went on vacation without her. Kathy starts and points the finger at Chanel number three, but number three points the finger right back at her. I propose that the other Red Devil killer is Chanel number three. And the person I think it is, is you. 
Number three then presents the most damning piece of evidence against Kathy yet, as number three witnessed Kathy eating a bologna sandwich out in public, thus proving that she lied about being allergic to bologna in order to avoid culpability in her ex-husband's murder. As damning of a piece of evidence as that is, Wes inexplicably interrupts this genuine bombshell to accuse his own daughter of being the killer. I think the killer might be you. Boo, this guy stinks. Wes says that he was suspicious after Grace was unaccounted for when Tiffany got lawn mowered, and he also checked the dates that Grace visited Wallace University for the first time, which just so happened to be the very day that previous Kappa president, Melanie Dorcas, got severely burnt after someone tampered with her spray tan machine. This triggers a flashback to that day, where we hear Melanie meanly dismissing a distraught Chanel, and also a look at what the other Chanel's used to dress like. In the flash Back, Grace wears this sweatshirt with a big R on it, which seemed to go along with this sweater worn by Boone earlier in the season with a big D on it, which was one of the many pieces of evidence that convinced me that Grace might actually be the Red Devil, but more on that later. Grace proves to her father that she's not the killer, and that she's pretty pissed that he would even think that. No, no she's not. And now I'm sure of it. Thank you for letting me talk about this, talk this out, and hear your side of the story. I'm so relieved. Don't talk. Pete then arrives and presents his own Red Devil theory, and it's Wes. You see, Pete's research has found evidence of Wes at one of Kappa's tunnel parties, proving that he once knew of the mansion's secret tunnels. Additionally, Pete says that he broke into Wes's apartment, stole some hair, ran a DNA test, and Wes just so happens to be Boone's father. And Hester's, for that matter, but most of them don't know that yet. Back at the Hamptons, Chanel takes a phone call from her mother, further shedding light on their complicated dynamic. Okay, drunk on wine is still drunk, mother. Never mind. You know, the, the one time I call you for a little advice, you're hammered. Then after a game of charade goes awry. Go! Uh, oh, the uh, only ugly gold wow. digger. Not welcome. Girl with a weird big neck. Uh, overfed! Overfed girl with a neck braid. Hester and Chanel leave the Hamptons together. Wes and Grace then discuss whether or not they'd be able to send their own blood to the electric chair, and Grace says that while the babies in the bathtub may be her blood, her Kappa sisters are her family, so she's willing to do what it takes. The father-daughter pair also clear each other of their previous suspicions. It could be anyone, except you and me, of course. Totally, totally. Yeah. If you've seen the episode before, you know how it ends, and if you haven't, let's just say something memorable and killer-related happens at the end of it, and since so much of the last half of the season hinges on trying to figure out the identity of the third and final killer, not including Pete, the writers make a point to have each and every character exit and re-enter the Kappa dinner scene multiple times, which was a really fun yet frustrating thing to obsess over as a fan trying to figure it out at the time. Chanel then arrives and enters the dining room with number five and Hester nowhere to be found. Pete is already at the table, and then Kathy and number three enter shortly after. But Kathy leaves once again, just as Zayde again enters from the kitchen. Soon after, Hester darts out of the kitchen with another very inconspicuous cover story. And what happened to you? I was sharpening this knife. I couldn't find Miss Bean's carver, but this one is definitely sharp enough to glide easily through roasted flesh. And then finally, Grace, Wes, and Kathy all enter with Chad arriving shortly after, making up with Chanel. Number three and number five then bring out the turkey, and Chanel does the honors of doing the big reveal. <laughs> R.I.P. G.G. Since this episode aired, it has been my favorite Scream Queens episode, and nothing that has come after has topped it. On paper, this episode shouldn't be so good. It fully separates our cast into different locations and puts a prolonged pause on the mystery for the first half of the episode in order to celebrate Thanksgiving at all these different characters' own households. And Thanksgiving, for me, is just the worst holiday of them all. However, by the end of the episode, a lot does actually happen. In this episode, we get the reveal that Wes is the father of Sophia Doyle mystery twins, and of course it ends with the revelation that Gigi has been killed, and thus there is one final red devil acting alone. 
sort of. I think why I like this episode so much is because it really sheds new light on three characters. Chanel number three, Chad Radwell, and Chanel Oberlin. And truly, it highlights how all three of those characters are actually very similar and they have a lot in common. They all, of course, come from filthy rich families who they each loathe for various instances of not-so-good parenting. And by the end of the episode, of course, our entire main ensemble comes together as a very dysfunctional yet still chosen family who are all about to eat some some lady's head. At this point in my life, I actually have no Thanksgiving traditions aside from watching this damn episode every year, and I literally do watch it every single year because I love it that much. 10 out of 10, no notes on this episode. As the Chanel's are shown to be some elite consumers, the episode after Thanksgiving naturally is all about Black Friday, the one day a year where Americans empty their bank accounts in the spirit of saving like $20. The episode begins with Chanel kicking off the holiday season. The greatest non Chanelloween holiday of the year, Black Friday. She then expresses her love of Black Friday as a montage of previous Black Fridays illustrate her tendency to use this holiday to buy her friends cheap gifts so that they'll question their friendship. She also says she bribes store security guards in order to get in early. Then she proceeds to tease the angry crowd of consumers who are clawing at the doors. In the present day, where it is still Thanksgiving night, Zayde attempts to digest the feast from the previous episode with Kathy. At first I was like, what a weird turkey. And then it clicked. Damn, it's a head. Oh, yeah. As it's almost midnight, the Chanel's have gotten ready and are about to head out for Black Friday, but Kathy says they've got to at least wait for the police to arrive. Chanel points out the police department's clear inadequacy, and she also points out just how clever the writing was last week. At one point or another tonight, on this delightful holiday evening, every one of us was alone and had access to that kitchen. Yeah, you guys, we noticed. Kathy then puts Chanel in timeout. You do realize I'm not seven, right? Chanel counters this with yet another Kathy Red Devil accusation, and the girls head to the mall. Meanwhile, at the police station, this random guy has managed to outdo the Red Devil's body count in just one night. I wanna know what I'm being charged with. You drove your pickup truck through the front window of a Best Buy. You killed the main 40 people, let's go. Grace, Wes, and Pete confront Detective Chisholm, and he reveals that the entire homicide department and the chief of police have been fired due to their inability to solve the Red Devil case. Because of this, this is Detective Chisholm's final scene, in a rare instance of a character just kind of disappearing, not dying, and after this scene, he is never heard from again. An unclear but seemingly lengthy time later, the Chanel's find themselves in a now deserted mall with the lights off. After discovering they're locked inside, the Red Devil shows himself. <laughs> Chanel notices an exit and escorts number three, number five, and number six to safety before declaring, I am Kappa President. Operating off the hunch that it's Munch, Chanel faces off with the Red Devil and his crossbow. Just like the Dickie Dollar Scholars thought baseball bats would work against the killer, Chanel similarly thinks that a sharp insult will be enough to take him down. She's wrong though, as Chanel ends up shot in the shoulder. Come on, finish me up, you shriveled up crone! Just then, a familiar voice comes to the rescue. <laughs> That's right, Denise Hemphill is now Officer Hemphill, as she's been hired as the new chief of police in this vague Floridian town. Now packing heat, Denise still thinks the killer is Zayde, and she's waving that thing, monologuing like there's no tomorrow. I am the new chief of police in this town. Ow. The Red Devil shoots Denise's partner, knocks over a tree, and gets away. Why didn't I shoot him when I had the chance? I was just talking so much. Chanel bounces back from her injury and makes it clear that Kathy is the killer. Oh, I'm not sure it's that clear at all. It's clear. And since the girls don't have much faith in the new police department, Chanel says that they must kill the witch themselves. Zayde takes a stand against murder, but surprisingly, Grace agrees that the girls must kill Kathy. I also think that Dean Munch is the killer. Thank you, talking pumpkin. Grace and Chanel synchronize, and it's clear Zayde feels like she's lost her bestie to the dark side. I say we poison her. I guess it's settled. 
Janelle and Grace attempt to assassinate Kathy by poisoning her during a fake meeting about feminism. They've done their research and they've made Kathy her favorite beverage, apple cider. This is not exactly a plot hole yet, but in the literal last episode of the entire series, it is revealed that Kathy nearly died because she had been severely dehydrated after replacing every beverage she's drank for the past couple of years with scotch. However, in this episode, clearly Kathy drinks apple cider semi-frequently. Both this apple cider subplot and the dehydration subplot in season two are, they're both stupid to begin with, but it's still slightly annoying that they made two contradictory beverage-related personality traits for Kathy across the two seasons. But in the grand scheme of things, this is this is a rather small inaccuracy between the two seasons, and we will be getting into a lot more of those once I dive deep into season two. Kathy drinks the whole poisoned jar of apple cider with no signs of being affected, and later Grace and Pete make out, and Pete tells her that he loves her. Grace says that she's not ready, and Pete changes the subject to try and convince Grace not to kill Kathy. After being convinced by Pete, Grace then tells Chanel about her change of heart about killing Kathy, and Chanel kicks Grace out of Kappa with the support of the three remaining Chanels. Zayde hangs back and says that now she actually agrees with Chanel, and killing Kathy is necessary. I honestly don't know why the characters collectively lock into Kathy at this point in the story. I mean, there's no way she's the sole killer, and they have no way of knowing how many killers there actually are at this point, so if they were to kill Kathy, there's an extremely likely chance that the murders won't end, even if she happened to be one of the killers. But whatever, I guess. One last goose chase before the two-part finale. Later, Pete cross-references with Wes about Gigi, and they discover her real name was Jess Meyer. Meyer, like one of the girls from that fateful 1995 night. Gigi, or Jess, was actually the sister of Amy Meyer, and this is when the full tale of the Hag of Shady Lane finally comes to light. Amy Meyer took care of Sophia's babies after her death until Amy ended up taking her own life due to the guilt she experienced after taking part in the cover-up. After Amy took her own life, that is when Gigi slash Jess took custody of the babies and took care of them in the abandoned house on Shady Lane. Grace then deduces that Gigi must have been a Red Devil killer and that Gigi must have raised the baby from babyhood to be killers as well and to enact this revenge plan on the people responsible for her sister's suicide. It's pretty crazy that Grace jumps to this full conclusion so fast because that pretty much is exactly the master plan behind the whole season and although she's now out of the picture, Gigi was truly the one who orchestrated this whole plan for that reason. And since the plan is now out in the open, let's poke a couple holes at it. Like I've alluded to before, Amy Meyer likely died due to her own guilt being blackmailed into covering up her good friend's death. And whose fault is that? Kathy Munch. As this episode exacerbates though, Kathy is unkillable. And the one time Gigi came masked to face with Kathy herself was when Gigi was dressed as Supreme Court Justice Scalia. And Gigi very cowardly backed out of that whole confrontation just because Kathy knew Taekwondo. So truly, Gigi and the others were just killing relatively innocent young adults who simply were participating in toxic sororities and fraternities. But because of Kathy, those young adults had no clue what happened to Sophia or Amy, so punishing them does not bring either of them justice. Although in hindsight, it is fitting that Mrs. Bean was the first kill of this whole master plan, not including that Red Devil guy, since Miss Bean was ready to throw Sophia into the meat process her and make sausages out of her. We need to dispose of this body on our own. Now I've got everything we need in the kitchen to make sausages out of her. I can sell them at the farmer's market on Sunday, or I can just feed them these bitches for dinner. <sighs> But just like pretty much any Ryan Murphy show, it seems like it's all planned out and airtight at first, but once you get closer to the finale, things start to make a little less sense and you kind of just have to go with it. After declaring Gigi a killer, Wes reflects on his relationship with her. She liked my playlists, and I believe that even though everything else was a lie, she really liked my playlists. Oh, she did, Dad. I'm sure she did. The Chanel's and Zayde then enact their next assassination ploy as they leave Kathy in a cryo chamber for far too long. If she tried to break the door down, her arms would snap off. Geez, there's a little movie called Terminator you girls might want to consider watching. But alas, Kathy survives yet again, and dare I say, now she's even stronger. Oh, I've never felt better. And later, the girls theorize about how Kathy keeps surviving their murderous plot 
and Hester says maybe she's some sort of immortal killer like Jason Voorhees, Michael Myers, or Dr. Giggles. I'm sure you know those first two, but I myself did not know who Dr. Giggles was, but he is actually a killer doctor from a 1992 film by the same name. In comparison to Halloween or Friday the 13th, Dr. Giggles was no box office smash by any means, but its inclusion in this line is likely a friendly reference to the director of the film, Manny Cotto. If you've never watched my coverage of American Horror Story or its spin-off, you may not have heard of Manny Cotto, but he was a producer and writer for many modern AHS seasons and a writer of more than half of the episodes of American Horror Stories. Interestingly enough though, at the time of this reference, Manny Cotto had not yet been engulfed by the machine that is Ryan Murphy Productions since his work with them actually began in 2018 when he was a consulting producer on AHS Apocalypse. I can't find any record of Manny Cotto working with or being friends with any of Scream Queen's three creators, but I have to imagine this had to have been the case, otherwise this connection is just a crazy coincidence. And to add an extra layer to this reference, Dr. Gil Dr. Giggles is of course about a killer doctor, and Scream Queen Season 2's main two antagonists are also killer doctors. Back to the episode, Chanel then kicks off a rare instance of Scream Queen's product placement as the brand new Samsung Galaxy Edge is the perfect phone for all of the Chanel's to have in order to send secret coded message using the phone's titular Edge screen. When I call you, the Edge will silently flash a color, in this case, red. Now, when you see the Edge, go red, don't even pick up. Just quietly head down to the university pool. Using this cutting edge technology, Chanel plans to trick Dean Munch into meeting all of them at a local pool where they will all drown her with chains. The Chanel's end up missing their cue, they don't notice the Edge, which honestly doesn't bode well for the phone, and Chanel ends up alone at the pool with Kathy and a bunch of chains. Why are you carrying a bag clearly filled with chains? Um, bondage. And the episode ends with Grace telling Pete that she's ready to go all the way with him, but clearly Pete's gotta get something off his chest. I don't want your first time to be with a murderer. And that is how episode 11, Black Friday, ends with just two episodes left to wrap up this big mystery for our final girls. As an episode, I like Black Friday, but I don't love it. I think both Black Friday and the next episode, Dorcas, serve the purpose of doing one last round of red herrings, pointing fingers, and wild goose chases instead of continuing the momentum after all of those revelations from the Thanksgiving episode. This episode instead details the girls' frivolous attempts at killing Dean Munch, who of course turns out to be unkillable. This never gets explained, it's just the way it is. That being said, the mall scene with the Chanel's and a crossbow wheel Red Devil is one of the strongest Red Devil related set pieces of the season, so that alone definitely elevates the episode significantly. Episode 12 aired with episode 13 as a two-part finale on Fox on December 8th, 2015. Part 1 of this finale is called Dorcas, and it begins with the payoff to the last week's cliffhanger, where Pete comes clean to Grace about how he was blackmailed by the Red Devils into becoming a double agent and a fourth killer. In his evil monologue, Pete takes credit for the murders of Roger and Boone, as well as taking credit for shooting Chanel and the police officer with the cross. Don't you see that they did that on purpose? They knew that if you actually killed someone, you would be their slave. God, we were the good guys. We were in this together. In this scene, Grace truly comes into her own as the last person she trusts has now turned on her and her pain and anger is communicated extremely effectively by Skylar Samuels in this scene. Pete then begins to reveal the identity of the final Red Devil killer to Grace. Before Speak of the Devil, she pops out of the closet and and kills Pete. Grace then brawls with the Red Devil, yet somehow doesn't unmask her. Later, Chanel slow-mo walks with her back to several protesters as an email she wrote to her fellow Kappa sisters somehow hit the presses and her incredibly strong word choice has incited rage amongst the masses. Side note, this very scene is based off of what Ryan Murphy says the entire character of Chanel Oberlin was based on, a very similar, strongly worded email written by an ignorant and entitled member of a sorority that ended up going viral. Some lines from the real, original email that are very Chanel Oberlin-esque include, newsflash you stupid cop. 
box. And, but Julia, you say in a whiny little bitch voice. There's so much more in this email, but a lot of it is very homophobic and ableist. So if you want the full context of the real person and her email that Chanel Oberlin was based off of, feel free to seek it out for yourself. I offer the following heartfelt sentiment. You can all suck it! <laughs> Despite her combative exterior, on the inside, this public scrutiny has destroyed Chanel. So she decides to order an asp on AliExpress so that it can kill her. But when it arrives, it turns out to just be your average garter snake wearing a sweater. Look at its markings. What markings? This is a sweater. Zayde consoles Chanel, extends an olive branch, and tells her she'll help her work on her racism problem. I know you and I haven't really always seen eye to eye. I mean, you say crazy mean stuff to me all the time, and I have a real problem with your casual racism, which is something we need to work on. Zayde then reminds Chanel that the two of them are Kappa co-presidents, and Zayde is hopeful that things are about to change for the better, and it may have to start with the two of them joining forces. But just then, the Red Devil barges in. Zayde disarms him, but it's clear something's not right. What's wrong with him? Zayde unmasks the Red Devil, and it turns out to be a pizza delivery driver who Hester tricked, tied a bomb to, and put inside the Red Devil suit. As the girls try to get to the bottom of this, Hester enters and starts spouting some bullshit misdirects about Melanie Dorcas, the former Kappa president who left school after being severely burned. Once the bomb is revealed, Hester is the first of the group to run away, but the others soon follow and they all take cover as the poor, random pizza guy gets blown to smithereens. Later, the Kappa foyer and living room is marked off as a crime scene, complete with blurry ass fake blood added in post. Feeling changed after her conversation with Zayde, Chanel pitches an apology tour to her fellow Chanel's. And to start, she wants to visit Melanie Dorcas. I don't think you said that you weren't the person who put the ass in the spray tanner. Well, I didn't, but she thinks I did. All the while, Chanel number no. five is clearly having a very difficult time processing recent events. <sighs> Then, in a plan orchestrated by Grace and him, Wes seduces Kathy while Grace and Zayde hack her laptop. But Wes ends up actually developing feelings for Kathy while doing so. Meanwhile, Grace and Zayde soon discover that Red Devil signs are pointing to Hester, as she's taken several fishy classes and has a social security number of 1234567890 listed on her record, as well as an address of 666 Sesame Street. At the Dorcas Manor, number five leaves early after receiving a rare Tinder match, and Chanel officially begins her apology tour as we finally get to see Melanie Dorcas post-incident. This is the estate that three generations of my family went insane in. Well, you look great. Zayde and Grace somehow arrive at the Dorcas Manor just in the nick of time and barge right in just as Chanel pulls out a pair of scissors and takes a swing at Melanie, all while revealing that this apology tour plan was just a ploy to kill Melanie as she completely fell for Hester's misdirects. Zayde stops Chanel's blade just as Grace drops the final bombshell of the season. It's Hester. Hester is the Red Devil. So sorry. They all arrive back at Kappa House with the intent of hunting Hester. They find number five though, whose Tinder match turned out to be a catfish of the lead singer of Nickelback, but they soon find Hester, who has lodged one of Chanel's high heels into her eye socket precisely so that it wouldn't kill her, and she then points the finger at number five. And this is how part one of the season finale ends. To be honest, this episode is just fine, but it definitely leaves a lot to be desired. Aside from solid character moments from Grace, Zayde, and Chanel, not a lot happens in this actual episode. Instead, the episode revolves around two pretty irrelevant events. Number one being the pizza guy explosion, which does not lead to any advancements in the Red Devil investigation. And then of course, Chanel randomly deciding to follow Hester's nudges towards Melanie Dorcas in this episode, which of course had nothing to do with the killer's identity. While all of this nonsense is happening, Grace and Zayde actually do get to the bottom of the Red Devil mystery, but it feels like it happens in episode two early as this is not the actual season finale. And the way that they figure out the final Red Devil's identity 
just feels too easy and rather anticlimactic. All they had to do to figure out that it was Hester was to simply look at her academic records. You mean to tell me that they couldn't have found that out all the way back when Pete was breaking into the admissions office, obviously Pete being a double agent, intentionally misleading Grace for the whole season makes this make a little more sense, but I mean come on, there were other people that were looking into this mystery and even Grace did plenty of research on her own, did she not once look into her Kappa sister's backgrounds? I find it all a little too hard to believe. This episode is also heavy on the drama and rather light on the comedy in comparison to some other episodes. And watching this episode is still a bit jarring because you come from an episode like this. Overfed! Overfed girl with a neck break! Straight into an episode that's full of stuff like this. Don't you see that they did that on purpose? They knew that if you actually killed someone, you would be their slave! The season one finale of Scream Queens is entitled The Final Girls, and since the last episode all but confirmed that the final Red Devil is Hester, this episode fittingly begins with a significant flash forward in time. It's now January 2016, towards the beginning of the second semester of the school year that began with the onset of the Red Devil serial killings. Zayde is now the sole president of Kappa Kappa Tau, and Grace is her vice president. The new treasurer of Kappa Kappa Tau is is none other than, drumroll, Hester. This revelation initiates a killer voiceover by Hester as she begins to detail exactly how she got away with it and how she got rid of the Chanel's once and for all. We then get flashbacks of Gigi raising Hester and Boone in the asylum, where as we know, Gigi raised them to enact the very plan that we just witnessed throughout this season. Throughout the flashback, it's clear that Hester has a gift for murder, and Boone, on the other hand, needs some work. As the time to set forth their master plan drew near Hester and Boone devised cover stories. So I needed a persona. Boone decided that his would be to pretend to be gay, which made like no sense since all that would do is make him stand out amongst those frat dudes, but Boone was never one for really being smart. Hester's cover story was to become quote unquote neck brace girl because according to her, the weirder you are, the less people ask questions. <laughs> Another flashback then shows us the actual first victim in Gigi, Hester, and Boone's plan, the original Red Devil mascot. The flashback continues as Hester and Boone then pour acid into Melanie's spray tan machine, and we then watch as Hester begins to point the finger at the Chanel's, first taking aim at number five. Hired actors playing Hester's parents then barge in to contradict Grace's theory about Hester being the baby in the bathtub, and soon after, Chanel number five's actual parents then show up and disown her and recite a fake story about how Sophia Doyle was Chanel Number no. Five's true mother. And it is also revealed that they too have been paid off by Hester. We've actually discussed doing exactly what you're proposing. As soon as she learned to talk, I wanted to disown her. Hester then pleads a case against Chanel Number no. Three, which consists of a story where Chanel Number no. Three has a split personality alter ego by the name of Dirty Helen. And Dirty Helen has been aiding Chanel Number no. Five in these killings unbeknownst to Chanel number three. So, Dirty Helen, I'm the other baby in the bathtub, and I want you to join my killing spree. Okay, cool. But let's not tell Chanel number three. Hester is so convincing that number three even starts to believe Dirty Helen is real. Hester then points the final finger at Chanel, and flashbacks reveal that Hester used Chanel's cards and dressed up like her in order to buy the Red Devil's various weapons throughout the season. And we finally get to see that it was Hester who turned on the deep fryer that killed Miss. Mrs. Bean. Denise then calls in the police department's new team of stripper cops who dramatically take the Chanel's into custody. Get him, boys! A few months later, in May of 2016, Kathy begins to narrate her own epilogue of the epilogue. Denise and Chad emotionally broke up. We're chasing waterfalls! We gotta stick to the rivers and the lakes that we used to! I don't have a choice is what I'm telling you. I gotta be in Quantico tomorrow! And Kathy also published a ghost-written book called New New Feminism. Maybe we'd be better off if a woman was in charge Everywhere! Exactly! <laughs> Chad then dedicates a memorial paid for by his family to the Red Devil's victims, and it is there where Kathy confronts Hester and tells her that she knows she was the Red Devil, and she knew it this whole time. I remember that little girl's face in the bathroom that night. 
It's burned into my memory, and I certainly would know what she would look like all grown up. This is another moment that really paints Kathy as an even more villainous person than the actual killers in this season, as not only did Kathy literally murder and dismember her ex-husband, she also blackmailed the young sorority girls of 1995 into aiding in the cover-up of Sophia's death, and 20 years later, when a revenge plan that hinged on that very cover-up started, she kept her mouth shut even though she had the information all along that could have stopped it from day one. Hester then claims that she murdered none of the victims aside from Pete. I'd also say she murdered Mrs. Bean, but I guess she can get out of that one on a technicality. Oh, and the pizza guy. She definitely killed the pizza guy. Kathy threatens to turn Hester in. Why did she wait this long? Who knows? But Hester then brings up the things I just did, the 1995 cover-up, and the murder of Kathy's ex-husband. And with that, the two deranged killers smile and agree to a truce. Okay. Okay, Thanks. great. Take care. You too. See ya. And then, in an epilogue to the epilogue to the epilogue, Grace shows Wes how she's now utilizing Chanel's closet by turning it into the Sophia Doyle crisis hotline. Now, any girl in the situation that Sophia found herself in in that bathtub 20 years ago has a lifeline. Wes tells Grace that he and Kathy are headed to Napa for a few weeks, and he feels confident giving Grace her space for the first time in her life. And thus, the father-daughter duo share one last goodbye that is noticeably much less emotional compared to their first. Meanwhile, the Chanel's are about to be found not guilty on their verdict day, but Chanel causes so much of a scene that the lead juror changes the verdict while on the stand. Number three wasn't given state-issued earmuffs, so she instead wears Princess Leia space buns, bringing the reference to Billy's mother, Carrie Fisher, full circle. The Chanel's then get sentenced to the Palmer Asylum, the same one Gigi raised Hester and Boone in, and in one final epilogue, Chanel number three is shown to have found a girlfriend in the asylum. Chanel number five was given meds that caused her to become actually close with Chanel. And then one night, Chanel is last to bed where she is soon startled by none other than the red devil standing above her bed. And that is where season one of Scream Queens ends. But while season two does have a significant time jump and a location change, they do pay off this cliffhanger. And we'll definitely get into that when I do a deep dive on season two, which I'm honestly more excited about doing than season one. As much as I love Scream Queens while it was airing and to this day, the season one finale was never one that blew me out of the water, and honestly back then I was still kind of bitter that Grace didn't turn out to be the killer, but now in hindsight it makes much more sense Hester being the killer than Grace. The most satisfying killers for this season were the ones we got, Hester, Gigi, Boone, and Pete, and I think they all fulfilled the role very successfully in their own way. That being said though, the season one finale of Scream Queens is still incredibly disappointing to me, killer reveal aside. Throughout interviews, Ryan Murphy consistently said that the killer's identity would not be revealed until the last episode, and also that only four or five characters would make it out alive of the season. In reality, the killer gets revealed in the penultimate episode, and ten major characters survive the season. All of the Chanel survive, Grace, Zayde, Kathy, Denise, Wes, and Chad, they all survive as well, and aside from Grace, they all make further appearances in season two. Now I definitely will not complain about those ten characters surviving the season, and living on in season two, but it's stuff like this that makes it very hard to trust the word of Ryan Murphy, who literally had fans anticipating that half of the cast were about to be murdered in some sort of bloodbath in this finale, but in reality, the only people that die in the finale episodes are Pete and a pizza guy. That being said, with nearly 10 years of hindsight on Scream Queens, I do think that it's a largely satisfying conclusion to what is a truly phenomenal season of television, but it also just so happens to be paced terribly, and it focuses on a lot of frivolous details to distract from a pretty weak evil master plan that when it comes down to it doesn't actually have a clear goal. The Hester reveal should have felt big and shocking, and there also should have been at least one other major death aside from Pete to really raise the stakes of this final confrontation. Speaking more about the episode's pacing, the flashbacks of our three killers in the asylum fly by in the beginning of this episode in a matter of just three minutes. Meanwhile, the scene where Hester frames each Chanel individually, that takes up literally 15 minutes of the finale, which is only 42 minutes long. And while this scene does provide for two or three laughs, it is not time well spent in the very last episode to just have the killer spread lies for 35% of the episode's runtime when the audience knows damn well nothing that she's saying is true. And what we'd much rather be hearing about is 
is, is that very master plan that actually doesn't make much sense. Listen, I love Scream Queens, and this season is still leaps and bounds ahead of season two, but I'd be kidding myself if I sat here and told you that this season doesn't suffer from Ryan Murphy finalititis. So picture this, I'm on my last day of writing some of the bonus sections for this very video, with about 75% of the video already edited, and then the LA Times drops this article about Kiki Palmer's upcoming book, where she reveals some negative experiences she had while on the set of Scream Queens. First and foremost, while Kiki Palmer does not name this cast member, she does say that one of her co-stars made a racist comment towards her in a moment of high tension. In her book entitled Master of Me, Kiki recalls a moment when she tried to settle a conflict between two of her Scream Queens castmates, but when she interjected, the unnamed cast member said something along the lines of, Kiki, just don't. Who do you think you are, Martin Luther King? Now, as I alluded to earlier in the video, these types of stories are unfortunately not new for Ryan Murphy Productions, with the most publicized offenders being Emma Roberts and Leah Michelle. Now, I'm not here to speculate on who Kiki specifically is talking about, but you know that the internet has already cracked the code, so all I'm gonna say is that the one main cast member from Scream Queens that Kiki Palmer does not follow just so happens to be Leah Michelle, but I'll let you make your own conclusions. Additionally, Kiki Palmer also recalled a moment when Ryan Murphy himself gave Kiki an angry phone call after after Kiki did not prioritize the show when a scheduling conflict arose on one of her days off. So basically, Kiki, the businesswoman that she is, had other business obligations scheduled on her days off while filming Scream Queens. Right off the bat, that sounds par for the course for all of the actors on Scream Queens. Remember how much I talked about Ariana Grande's schedule literally determining a lot of the scheduling decisions in regards to filming the episodes that she's in? So the fact that Kiki Palmer wasn't given that same sort of great to do her other priorities seems incredibly unjustified given the busy schedules that her castmates have as well. Kiki says that she was made aware that she was expected to be on set for a day that she was previously given off, and when she prioritized a prior obligation, Murphy called her unprofessional and said, I can't believe that you, out of all people, would do something like this. This story feels incredibly familiar for Ryan Murphy, who had a very similar story told about him involving an angry phone call in in 2023, Angelica Ross, who of course starred in Pose and American Horror Story 1984 and Double Feature, she came out with stories of unprofessionalism on the set of 1984, with the main two offenders being Emma Roberts and Ryan Murphy, and also an unnamed crew member. I talk about this entire situation in extensive detail in this video, but back to Kiki, she believes that her decision to not prioritize coming to set on her day off is the reason why she and Ryan Murphy never work together again after Scream Queens, despite Kiki previously having hopes that she would become one of his regular players, like Emma Roberts or Sarah Paulson. I am writing this section on November 11th, and Kiki's full book hits shelves on November 19th, so be sure to check it out. I know I'll be purchasing a copy, and if she happens to shed more light on her Scream Queens experience, I will be sure to talk all about that in further Scream Queens deep dives. Three days after Kiki's LA Times article came out, her co-star Skylar Samuels released a statement echoing Kiki's experiences. Skylar's statement reads as follows, I am incredibly proud of Kiki for speaking out about her experiences on Scream Queens. That's what Kiki does, she speaks up and stands up for herself and others. Scream Queens was a very challenging show to make. Kiki was one of the only people who stood up for me. She was brave enough to have my back even though she knew it might make her a target of bullies on set. I have unending gratitude for the professionalism and kindness Kiki showed me. She is a leading lady in this industry who is well aware of her influence and she uses it for the better. Believe it or not, it's been almost 10 years since Scream Queens first aired. As a fan, since the promotional campaign, I can say for certain that Scream Queens was not appreciated in its time. The ratings alone reflect this, but clearly Fox saw value in the show and renewed it for a second season, where the writers could fully exercise the semi-anthological concept of the series with a drastic location change. I'm already working on my season 2 deep dive, and while I won't lie and say that it fully recaptures the magic of the first season, it is still a very underrated season of television in my opinion, and I can't wait to talk about all of its ups and downs very soon.
but I want to reiterate the sentiment that this show was truly ahead of its time. You could say this based on the fact alone that its popularity and cultural relevance has only gotten larger and larger in the 10 years since it aired, but also stars like Kiki Palmer, Jamie Lee Curtis, and Glenn Powell, just to single out a few, have had huge career moments since the cancellation of the show after season 2, and not just them, so many of the Scream Queens cast members are currently incredibly booked and busy, which unfortunately makes it likely that a revival will never happen, solely based on scheduling conflicts alone, and also given Kiki Palmer's recent revelations and both Emma Roberts and Leah Michelle's publicized history of offensive and unprofessional onset behavior, yeah, I think it's time we let this season 3 ship sail. I would be lying if I didn't say some of the joy has been taken out of this series for me. This is something I've been grappling with for a while. Ryan Murphy's ethics have been questionable for the entirety of this channel. And so basically I've been debating to what extent is separating the art from the artist just turning a blind eye. At the end of the day, I don't think there is a right answer, and if there is, I definitely have not found it. However, the teenaged me who watched this show every week in 2015 had yet to know about any of these things, and that version of me loved this show like nothing I'd ever watched before. And I think you can see that reflected in this video. But I am no longer a teenager, and I now recognize the show's satirical take on racism and other things like ableism or homophobia also lacks very much perspective, especially when you consider how it's be being written almost solely from the perspective of the Chanel's. Meanwhile, with the exception of Zayde, other characters like Tiffany or Sam are just boiled down to stereotypical jokes at their own expense, and they never once attempt to humanize them. And while Zayde herself feels more nuanced than Sam or Tiffany, a lot of that does come from Kiki Palmer's interpretation of the character, and in reality there isn't a lot of substantial depth that the writers give her on the page. There's basically one flashback of how she was bullied in high school by carbon copies of the Chanel's that all in all feels pretty lazy, and if you compare Zayde's backstory to Grace's, Chanel's, or number three's, it feels like Zayde was never a true priority in the writer's room, which definitely feels like a missed opportunity if one of this show's main goals was to satirize racism in sororities. I keep mentally coming back to the hazing scene from episode two. Hello, hood rat. Sweet Jesus, I don't even know where to begin with you. Bitch, I'm about to smack you so hard your tampons gonna pop out. And while when he talks about it in interviews, Ryan Murphy touts how much this show is about satirizing the ignorant narcissist like Chanel and her Chanel's, it begins to feel less like satire when you start to listen to the stories of actresses like Kiki Palmer, Angelica Ross, Samantha Ware, and others. All of these stories paint a broader picture of Ryan Murphy and his productions not being a safe space for a person of color to stand up for themselves in. Meanwhile, the very people who are making offensive comments are the ones put in positions of power. There needs to be much more accountability taken by these people, but mostly by Ryan Murphy. But instead, he is creating a narrative that anybody who criticizes him is then barred from ever working with him again. Here's where I'm at with it all currently. Two things can be true. This show meant and means a lot to me, and there still hasn't been a show since it that has captured me in the same way that it did. But at the same time, it is not unaffected by the actions of the people involved with it. And I think it would be wrong to not acknowledge that there is a much larger conversation to be had about Ryan Murphy and the racism he tolerates on his sets, all while making fun of that exact thing in his scripts. But with that seriousness out of the way, I am already embarking on my journey through Scream Queen Season 2, where we will be talking about the good, the bad, the ugly, and the downright infuriating. So make sure you're subscribed for that, give this video a like if you made it all the way to the end, and I will see you next time.